Hey everybody, we are live on a Thursday evening here in the UK. Hopefully you're joining me from wherever you are in the world. I know we've got a couple of people even from Australia in. This is uh, Vim PF from No Nonsense Whiskey coming to you live. And today we've got another Dram Team kind of uh, tasting through from one of their boxes. We've got six Drams to go through for tonight. But first of all, I'll introduce the guests who we've got in. Uh, we've got Chris, who is the founder of um, the Dram Team. So you want to say hi, Chris? Hey everybody, nice to be here again, Vin. Cool, good to have you. And we've also got Rob, who is uh, kind of involved in the Dram team a little bit at the start, but is also a blogger from Bristol, right? That's correct. I'm also here and a super fa uber fan of the, the Dram team and obviously No Nonsense Whiskey. So. Of course, of course. We're all fans of each other, right? That's the way we like to say it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, this, uh, this thing, before we uh, get into it, is one of these boxes again. Um, this is one of the subscription services that I, uh, I get, Dram team, and I pay for this every month. We get five big ones, one little one every month. Uh, this month, it's going to be myth busting blends. Which is an exciting thing, I think. What got made you guys think about uh, doing the blends then? Because uh, they're cheap. No, no, that's not why. <laughs> um, no, they. Um, I think everyone. I'm sure the, the viewers of your channel know this. That blends get a rough reputation compared to single malts and you get a lot of probably the probably some of the less educated sing, uh, whiskey drinkers like oh i only drink single malt uh, it's something you'll hear quite a lot of whiskey festivals and things like that so it's sort of just a way of introducing our drinkers um to the fact that some blends are exceptional now most of what's in the box obviously because it's in line with the normal sort of budget we put in the box is pretty um pres prestige blends really it's not your kind of everyday drinking blend it's in the, it is in the same product category as single malt but it's just nice to show that um they can be really great and also just that something being a blend is relatively meaningless we'll, we'll get into that and why like some of the ones here really exhibit that really nicely uh why that the, the blend category is quite misunderstood and really there's no reason it can't be considered just as prestigious as single malt so it's just a bit of it's a bit of fun and it's also just great whiskey from some really good whiskey makers as well Awesome. Yeah. And I thought this would make a good live stream because uh, a lot of people, like you say, they overlook the blends. So uh, it's nice to give uh, an overview of, uh, well, I would say five proper blends and one that's a little bit of a cheat. But um, when we'll get we'll get through to that when we get through to it. But I just want to say hello to a few people that have dropped in nice and early. Uh, we've got Prestige Liquids, WW, who's dropped in from uh, Melbourne, I think. Oh, you're Melbourne or Sydney. I can't remember which one you are. Sydney, maybe. So he's uh, on his way to work, actually, in the morning, which is a Fills me with dread. Um, we've got Show Malt Drams is in. Thank you for joining. Cask Mate also. Mash and Drum. Uh, we've got Drew Bills who says Weetabix, which is a, a heart back to a post I made this morning about my Weetabix packet being ruined. Uh, Lee Cope's in. Travis Souders. Eric Waits in from California. Apparently they're getting some rain, which is quite rare, I think. Uh, also, Go Habs. Uh, and Garcia is in, Loch Ness is in. Wow, some amazing people already in. Brilliant. Thank you very much for joining, everybody. Hopefully, some more people will be in later, and uh, we can be talking about these drams. So, should we? have you got the first one poured, guys? Because I have. Got the first two poured. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. Well, let's hit it. So, the first one is Douglas Lang, King of Scots. And I've got the card here, so I can hold this up so that everyone can see. So what we're doing. Get the cards open. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I've, you can see I've written on here as well um, the prices just so I can tell everyone how much they are because I haven't actually tried. This might be the first time I haven't tried any of these. I've just told a lie. I have tried the Batiki whiskey one before. But um, apart from that, this is a, a completely blind tasting to me. I've never tried any of these. But the King of Scots is the first Douglas Island. It's really quite treat, uh, cheap. It's like £17 at the moment, which is... It is. Yeah, it's, it's less than your normal ones, but I think that's balancing out by the value of the rest of them. Well, right, yeah. Uh, so obviously, that like with blends, they can be cheap, right? I think um, a lot of the the kind of supermarket blends that you'll see, not supermarket own brands, but just the ones that are cheap in supermarkets, could typically be about three quarters grain, like young grain as well. Which, much as it makes a good base uh, for a blend, doesn't necessarily lend itself to a load of character when it's put in at young and at seventy five percent of the the whiskey. But the the thing about the King of Scots is like. I think within this set, it's kind of position is that it's a baseline dram. So it's actually made, it says it's in the bottle, I think it's it's actually a Douglas Lang brand. So as you know, the dram team are big 
big fans of Douglas Lang, mainly because they endlessly release brilliant single cast whiskies every month that makes our life creating good selections a lot easier. And they're very reasonably priced as well for the stuff that they put in the bottle. Um, so it's sort of um, a baseline blend in this, but I think what it exhibits for me, and this is true of a lot of some of the mainstream blends, is just that you can buy drinkable whiskey. And I don't mean drinkable as in like, oh, I can force it down. Like as in if you drank it in isolation in the right context, you would enjoy drinking it. And it's less than 20 quid, which, you know, we've, we've, I've said this before about the, the Glen Murray supermarket range. It's about 20 quid. Like, it's amazing that that can be done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this, is, um, this is one of the ones I've kind of overlooked before because I see the price tag and think, ah, oh, maybe not, maybe not. But um, I mean, I've been nosing this thing now and it's nosing and tasting. I think the nose is better than the palate. I'll, uh, I will say that off the, right from the bat. Yeah, I agree with that. The nose is quite aptly to me. Like. I think I think it's interesting as well. Sorry to chime up after being quiet, but <laughs> letting you guys get on with it. But um, I think it's really interesting that we, as like whiskey fans, we have this real preoccupation with single malt when actually we're still talking about ninety-two percent of all whiskey drunk around the world being blended whiskey. I think it's something we need to kind of almost get over because through our we've been um, running a tasting event for a few months now and chatting to people who say i'm not a whiskey fan i don't drink whiskey i don't want to spend this amount of money finding blended whiskeys that are circa 20 30 quid is like their raison d'etre they want a great whiskey that's that price and things like this can kind of offer that can't they yeah absolutely and it's it's one of these things i think well, it's important to talk about stuff like this um like i know there's uh some uh well, let's not be around the bush. Though. Someone like Ralphie, for instance, who doesn't want to cover anything that it doesn't have an age statement on it. And that's that's fine. I get that. But the way that the climate's going at the moment, uh, it, whiskey has to be uh, sustainable for the for the people who make it. Right. So they and, and approachable and approachable and affordable for the people who drink it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's more and more and more people drinking it. And not everybody can go out and spend 80 pounds on a bottle straight off the bat. And we do have two whiskies here that are that sort of price range so this is kind of a kind of covering the whole breadth of it i think we've got so just on first count we've got this one's at 17 pounds then we step up to 35 we've got a couple at 50 one at 80 and one at 150 which is the phenomology can't wait to try that by the way haven't tried that i had a little sniff earlier and it smells amazing but that's for further down the line but so what do we think about the nose on this one then the king of scots it's a really, I, I, I felt quite closed at the at first, quite sort of toffee maybe. But then, like, as it as it sat in the glass a little bit more, you've got those apple noses and it's it's an interesting one because it's I mean it's clearly heavily grained to make it that cheap. But I'm not getting kind of I'm not getting that kind of chemically note I get from young grains like. Uh, Hate club and things like that you know it's very chemically uh and just generally not that nice i don't think especially the clubman but um yeah the, the nose on it's great I'm, I'm enjoying this nose i'd be happy about it i've got a bit of advice don't add any water i just <laughs> i lost my water drop for a minute i have no idea where it went i had one on my desk and i've lost it um so i tried to pour by hand i've just slopped water into it and now it both smells worse and tastes worse. So like, that's quite unusual, <laughs> but I'm just going to go down and just say don't put any more. <laughs> well, that's a top tip. Um, there's no, some comments going on about uh, the comment I made about Ralphie just then, saying uh, Ralphie does do a lot of NAS, though. Um, and Jason Coates confirms, yeah, uh, Ralphie, at the beginning, it's just before I started my channel, actually, he made a, a video saying that he would no longer cover anything that didn't have an age statement or some other method of telling the age. So he did have... Uh, he did have the, the Cotswolds, which doesn't have an age statement, but it has the um, date of distillation on it, so you can ascertain the age from that. So, um, yeah, he, he's genuinely stopped doing all, all NASs unless it's got some way of, of ascertaining the age. So this thing, it's clearly young, it's clearly young. I've just tried a little bit on the palette, and I'm not overly impressed with the palette, I'll be honest there. No, I agree. Like as What I'm 
uh, this is a bit of a self-indulgent dram, not in the, you know, in the drinking of it necessarily for me, but in the sense that I find it literally ridiculous that this can be made. So as you said, it's 17 pounds. Bear in mind that has VAT on it. Bear in mind it has to be 40% because it's whiskey. Uh, so the, the value, the tax <laughs> duty on a bottle of whiskey is um, 28 point something pence a litre, which works out to be about eight to nine pounds, I think, uh, for a 700 um, milliliter bottle. So this bottle I bought for something like 13 quid trade price X VAT or something like that. So like there's something like a three or four pound gap between the duty that Douglas Lang had to pay to even make it and the price it sold at excluding VAT. So that includes the bottling, everything that goes into it. And it still has to be aged for three years. So like it, it's, I don't even understand how they're making it at that price. It must be some sort of loss leader or something. But King of Scots isn't even a big name, name brand. So I think it's just fascinating to me as a demonstration of how amazing it is that whiskey can be produced that is drinkable, that costs as little as this, given the, the taxation. Isn't um, King of Scots as well? Isn't it a little bit of a, a Dram Team exclusive here in the UK? Because isn't it primarily sold abroad? I think there was something like that. I did. I know that was. We've got another blend coming up in our Christmas box, which is actually a twelve-year-old blend, which is a bit um, more expensive, and it's it's absolutely beautiful. It's one of the the best uh, shared Drams I've had in a while. Um, I can't remember if it was that one or this one that was kind of not readily available in the UK, but it's certainly not commonly seen. So it's interesting to try it. But I think it just, I think really sets the scene for um, the rest of the drama. I, I don't know how many uh, design nerds you have on your channel, Vin, but I really like the Lion Rampart on this bottle. I think it's a really cool, like properly Scottish looking bottle. Yeah. I don't know I, if that again, I'll, show, I'll show the bottle we've got up here. Um, it's, it's a, it's a bare bones bottle for sure, but considering the uh, the nature, I hope that's showing up the right way around. And on my screen, it's showing up back to front, but never mind. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's a bare bones bottle, but it's 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 an interesting one as well. But and like you said, I, I mean, I didn't know it was uh, exclusive to the UK, and I haven't actually seen this on any shelves. Um, I I did check out point, and I can get it on online, but yeah, it's on Master of More. I think. Yeah, it's one of those ones though. Like it, I, I would I would definitely recommend this. Uh, if you were buying something on Master of Mole and you bought something that was just under the free delivery threshold and you were looking for something that, that wasn't going to like push you right over, but you could just add this into your basket and it, you, you wouldn't care. You could add it into mixes. You could give it to that person who comes around who says, can I have whiskey and Coke, please? Um, and you could enjoy it. You know, it's one of those ones where I've, I've, I've got some really awful whiskey on my shelf at the moment, uh, like the uh, the White Walker. We were talking about this before. Oh, yeah. um, I can't even, I can't reach for it. I really can't. I've tried to go back to it a couple of times. It really is just awful. This one, I, um, although I've got stuff that, that beats it for by, for sure, it's it's worth drinking still. I could drink it. I think for your, for your viewers on a tasting notes kind of front, it's, it has got that real grain, lead flat feel to it, hasn't it? It's really kind of, it has got that creamy, cereally flavour, but then the kind of toffees, and but also, I guess probably why you're not not really liking it is it's it's kind of quite brash, like it's smooth, but it, it, it's you can taste the al almost taste the alcohol. It sounds like a stupid thing to say when you're tasting whiskey, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I get it. I get it. It's like that kind of. Um, I always think it's in, especially in youthful grain. You can kind of taste that uh, industrial nature of it all. Um, it it feels like. It doesn't. It doesn't feel like it's been aged with care. Uh, some grains. I'm not saying this one. This one tastes good, but some grains they taste like they've literally produced it as cheap as they can to get it into as glass uh, as cheap as they can, so that you can get some cheap whiskey. Whereas, like the next one that we go to, uh, although a little bit expensive for what it is, I think it's it beats it. I think. How do you feel about moving on to it? I'm more yeah, happy. Yes, let's, um, let's not dwell too long on the baseline. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's reference what blend that we've put in. Um, it, it, as I say, it's more a point of interest. I think it's interesting to taste something that is almost produced specifically with the aim of being inexpensive and just appreciating how remarkable that price point is. Absolutely. Um, and also just 
like Rob said, 92% of blends, to be honest, a lot of what we're going to be tasting is the is is the one percent within that ninety-two, and the other ninety-one percent is stuff like King of Scots. So, like, mm. um, it's interesting to taste that bit of the iceberg that's below the water before we move on to the tip that we want to. Uh, yeah, I think I, I do agree with what you said, Chris. There, and I think the Dram team is really good for this. Is that you wouldn't necessarily pick that bottle up, which is a really good reason for drinking it. Like, I, I remember when we did a Dram team stand at a whiskey festival, and we had. Um, the Aldi Highland Black, which I, th I think is featured on your channel, hasn't it, Vin? Yeah, I um, I kind of give it a bit of a slam in, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I uh, I said, I mean, it's the thing about it is, it's it's okay for thirteen pounds, but and if that's your budget for thirteen pounds for whiskey, then you know, fill your boots. But for me, if that was my monthly budget, I would rather save that twice and get something for twenty six pounds that would be a lot better. I was just going to go on and say it, yeah. <laughs> which kind of makes me look a bit daft now, but Carry I on. think it, it's a really good whiskey, which is like sounds like the, the, the talk of an alcoholic, but <laughs> where you've got like a palate setter or something that kind of almost like gets you in that mood for whiskey and then you move on to other stuff. And I think they this the, the King of Scots and that, they operate almost like in a different sphere. And I think they, that they're good examples of cheap whiskey, which I think, well, maybe it's a, a category that's un underexplored. Yeah, for sure. Um, before we move on to the next one then, I just want to say hello to a few people that I definitely missed. Um, I don't want to exclude people, so I'll, I'll just scroll back a little bit. Um, Callum Fine and Rare, hey, thanks for coming in. I'm not sure if I said hello to Jason Coates, but I'll, I will do another one anyway, thank you. Uh, Travis, I did, uh, for sure. Keep going. Uh, Christine Deems, I definitely missed. Sorry for missing you. Thank you for coming in um we've got a bit further down max i said about his question earlier rob that's you you're in uh ben marnix in he he confirms the 28.74 per liter of alcohol for duty which is insane um trenny and c is here but it's c on the uh, on the typing thank you for coming in graham young is here and i think i'm about caught up uh Frank Lampard, not the. Uh, not I'm pretty sure it says Frank football. Lampard is drinking yeah. whiskey. I've, I've always assumed it isn't the footballer, but if it is, then I'm super happy to have someone like famous following me. But I'm, I'm pretty sure you are. But thank you very much for joining. Um, and the Bourbon Brothers is in as well. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, so next up, we've got the blender at uh, the blender, Nika blended whiskey. Which is yeah, I like the. Um, sorry, you're showing the car. That's cool. all right. No, you carry on. <laughs> Um, I like the just the simple understatement of the name of this. It's like we are Nika, and we have made a blended whiskey for you to enjoy, and, and no other pretension. If you see the, the bottle on the card when Vin shows it again in a sec, the bottle sort of reflected that same uh, approach. It's just like it speaks for itself. Yeah, so I'll, I'll put it up now. So this is the uh, the bottle. If anyone has seen it or not, uh, I've seen this around. I haven't seen it on many shelves, that's for sure. But um, I've tried a couple of uh, Nika's no age statements now, and I've been generally impressed at their ability to keep the price low, uh, especially with stuff like the um, from the barrel, incredible whiskey that's still fairly cheap. Uh, this is is very good. You know, they, they consider it their entry point. Thirty five pound for an entry point is a, a little high, I think, but um, I'm not going to grumble at that. Not for good whiskey, that's for sure. Consider that against Yamazaki 12, which I saw today is like 115 quid and used to be 45 quid a bottle and 30, 35 quid doesn't look that pricey. Right. This is one of those funny whiskies. We were on holiday in Cornwall. Um, desk badly packed and not taking anything. And we popped into a little shop called Wadebridge Wines, which is obviously as it sounds in Wadebridge. And they had this dram on offer and picked it up and I was so surprised about how I'd like actually genuinely loved this whiskey. And it, and it kind of changed my mind about blended whiskey. It was the first one where I'd kind of thought, wow, that, that can be. Well, have we lost him? Oh, he's in and out. Oh, there we go. No. So we missed the last bit of your sentence there, Rob, if you're still hearing us. <laughs> Uh, I think Rob's got a bit of a sketchy internet, so we'll we'll let him drop in when he uh, when he comes what, back. Was at what point? <laughs> at what point did you lose me? <laughs> I'm not sure. 
<laughs> I've forgotten now. You're telling us you got hold of the bottle. Um, well, I, was just, I was waxing lyrical about how good this whiskey is and how I really like it. Kind of like it's kind of like a bad preamble to me tasting the whiskey. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I, I like that because it's um, when when you can say that. Like I like to say on some of my videos, uh, you know, you, you want to do things in an order. You want to do an introduction. You want to do a bit of a, a talk about the, the whiskey itself, nose taste, and then say if you like it or not. But sometimes I'm just like, look, guys, this uh, this whiskey's awesome. I'm just going to say that right from the start. So you, you're <laughs> in the and this is one of those. You know, it's, it's a it's literally like a no-nonsense whiskey, to use my own moniker, and uh, it, yeah, it just, it smells like, I'm looking at the tasting notes here, uh, and these are the ones you got from, from the websites or the bottles or whatever was available to you, right? Yeah, uh, this one, Nick, it can be tricky to track down tasting notes for, so because they're associated in the UK with Speciality Brands, which is the sister company to Speciality Drinks, which is part of the same group as the Whiskey Exchange, so for those, we'll often just use some of the whiskey exchanges notes. As you can see, they're quite extensive for this one, um, despite it being relatively understated in presentation. For me, the thing that stands out like this is I've already tasted it. I'm running ahead a little bit. But like, um, whereas with the King of Scots, you said that the nose was, you know, a bit more, delivered a bit more than you then got on the palate. I find this the other way around. The nose is relatively subtle. Um, in general and then when I drink it I'm getting a lot more flavor than I would expect from the nose and I, I'm pretty certain there's some smoke in there but I, it doesn't you know it doesn't mention that on the um, tasting notes but I definitely get a kind of waft of something like smoke if it isn't smoke I'm not sure mm. yeah it's uh, I mean like you say the, the notes on here are extensive I mean I get the apples and pears it's it's almost like a space ID nose to it um but it it, it goes into some crazy stuff like chocolate and almond paste and praline. I'm, I'm not down with that. I don't get any of that. But it, it generally, it's just like a nice, easygoing nose. I think like a space ID kind of nose, like I said. Yeah, like quite fresh, and it does. I think it says that. For us, I started directly quoting the tasting notes by accident. <laughs> but it has got, um, yeah, really like a light space. I think maybe even like a, I think we're gonna. Have some of this in 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 one format later. Craig Ellicky, a little bit like um, quite a young nose, even if it was older. I don't actually know anything about the age of this whiskey or the blend composition. It's quite difficult to find that out. Mm. Um, just as a point of interest, I was reading something. I read an article recently, maybe it was on Scotch Whiskey, um, the website scotchwhiskey.com, okay. about Japanese whiskey and the regulation of it because it's essentially like very unregulated it's hard to know what you're getting in something called Japanese whiskey because what they allow you to do is import whiskey from elsewhere in the world so for example you could import scotch whiskey into Japan uh, blend it in Japan and call it Japanese whiskey um, so it's very dissimilar to scotch in how protected it is in that regard so or how well and clearly defined and labeled it is um so basically something called blended japanese whiskey may include whiskey from any country and you wouldn't know you you, and it, you would obviously as a consumer assume that it was uh you'd assume that was ja like made in japan but japanese blended whiskey didn't necessarily made in japan it, um it can come in from elsewhere so it's a bit um i think they're going to some of the bigger players in the market who obviously are making it in Japan um, are keen to sort of distinguish between the two to avoid people trading on the good name of Japanese whiskey with it's, it's not really about being inferior pro product because whiskey from elsewhere can be brilliant right and if just because you blend it in Japan doesn't make it less good but it definitely is misleading to the consumer and I think that's something that the whiskey industry in general tries to avoid yeah, um, definitely. Most of the world around. I think, um, like uh, someone's commented, McCallum Fine and Rare said there are lots of Ben Nevis and Tomatin in Japanese whiskey. And I think um, Ben Nevis is, uh, I can't remember, is, is it a sun tree? Or is it part of the, I can't remember, but basically uh, the Ben Nevis distillery is owned by the same people that I think maybe owns Nika. Uh, and they have a lot of influence in their drams and send over a lot of stuff to them to be blended, like exactly like you say. Mm. Uh, and I, I always think he's a bit off for sure. Um, I like to have complete parity. Uh, I got myself in a bit of trouble recently on um, Facebook, uh, arguing with a, with a, with a no-name person um, about the origins of Tin Cup. 
if you have seen this um no, but, yeah yeah and it's uh in the uk it says colorado it, it's very very clever it doesn't say colorado whiskey it's like colorado mixed with like colorado water and stuff like that but it's uh indiana whiskey it's uh, made at mgp and um cut with colorado colorado water and they got in a lot of trouble in america so on the back of the american bottles it says this was sourced at mgp this is what we did with it but in the uk it doesn't so i said that the bottle is a bit of a lie because it is really it's like colorado this colorado that but really it's just a bit of colorado water and uh this guy was was really upset about me saying that really like really upset <laughs> so uh you know how we can be as whiskey drinkers um Tra uh, Trenny and C ask a question uh, about, they said, well, they didn't really ask a question to be fair, but they said they haven't found a knicker that's worth selling the cash out for. Uh, do we think that we could recommend him one if it isn't this? Uh, definitely. Uh, everyone I know has tried knicker from the barrel, uh, rave about it. So, and I think it's very good. I actually think this one's very good. Like the palette on this, I'm really enjoying. I, I think I was wrong about the smokiness, but it's just something about the depth and fullness of it that gives it that feeling as if it, that you might get from a smoky dram sometimes. Maybe there's a mustiness or something in there that I'm just getting confused by, but this one I think is okay. I don't think it's gonna blow anyone's socks off like a, um, it's not gonna overwhelm anyone, but um, it's definitely not gonna underwhelm you. But Nicker from the barrel, people rave about it. It's it's a very popular. I, I've, uh, I've, I've relocated for uh, hopefully a better <laughs> <Love that. laughs> connection. <laughs> Hence the uh, few moments of silence. Apologies to everyone involved. It'd be really interesting to know what um, if Trenny and C could say, like, what have they drunk that's Nicker, and why didn't they work? Why didn't they like it? Because that will be what's interesting to me. But I think there is there's a few really different Nickers that I've tried that could, and it depends on your, your that kind of your palate, what you enjoy, doesn't it? Really. Whereas this, like, this stuff is. It's still really entry level, but and and I actually agree, Chris. I don't um I don't think you're wrong in saying there's smoke in there. I think there's definite like a coming almost like a waft in the background, and and in a funny way, I've always thought this one really reminded me of um and this might kill your audience, but Johnny Walker <laughs> Black. I think okay, it's a, yeah, there's, a, there's a JW Black kind of feel to it. See, I I haven't covered the black yet, but I uh, I'm a big fan of it actually. Um, it's leagues leagues ahead of the red um the red is very undrinkable in my opinion um <laughs> very very like, this is a very undrinkable whiskey <laughs> yeah um i just like it's one of, uh, the way i define it i mean i've got very cheap tastes people know this i cover cheap whiskey for <coughs> but rule number one has to be that uh, i need to re i need to want to reach for it and I, I'm, so right now, I don't have a, amazing whiskies by any stretch. I've got reasonably priced whiskies less than fifty pounds. When I've got something like Johnny Walker Red in, I do not reach for it at any point in time ever. It, it, that's just a fact. So I just I, it had to be tipped away or given to somebody else or whatever. So um, but yeah, but, but to go back to what you're saying, the, the black is really quite nice and very cheap as well. Only about twenty pounds, twenty something pound in the UK. It can be more, but. It's not necessary to pay more for that, though. It is such a good, like a well-priced whiskey. So, uh, what twenty is? Uh, well, C, sorry, says um, he said he can't remember what he tried, but he tried three or four at a whiskey festival and didn't enjoy any. So it may well be that uh, whatever he's drank before, or um, may maybe have kind of ruined the taste of it. But I think, yeah, I mean, he, he said he'll give him another go. But if you get the chance, uh, I know, um, obviously, they're in Canada, so they get absolutely bent over for prices over there. Um, I wouldn't recommend spending too much on these things. But if you do find one for a good price, maybe try it in uh, in, in the confines of itself. So um, the, the, the three bottlings say uh, that we started, Nico, was one of the first whiskies I ever tried, actually, after getting into scotch. And one of my friends had uh, one of our good friends, Simon, who's uh, at Shitsky on Instagram because he's uh, a master at taking all four photographs of whiskey. <laughs> um, he gave me a bottle, a uh, little dram of his Nicker Black. And I think that because the Nicker Black is in like a small, bo smaller bottle, I think it might be a 50 CL. It, it, it's never been that badly priced. And I think the Nicker White, Black and Red in that little series are a great compendium of three drams to try. That's my personal personal shout out to Trenny and C. 
on, on the subject of Nico, I have for science dug out my bottle of uh, nice because it's just on the shelf next to me. And it is, it's it's a massive step up even, I'm really enjoying the, the Nicker blended that we're drinking, but this is a massive step up. It's, for a start, it's stronger. So it's at 51.4% this one. Mm-hmm. Um, so it packs a bit of a punch. And you can really taste the difference of that. It's one of those ones that really has benefited from having the extra strength. Um, but I saw in the comments there, um, did, someone, did Brandon Lee say something about coffee grain? I'd completely forgotten about coffee malt and coffee grain. So coffee malt, I'm not a mass fan of. It's perfectly nice. It's just not my sort of whiskey. But coffee grain, I go mental over. I love grain whiskey. I normally like old grain whiskey. Um, I think that's what suits it best. And certainly in terms of scotch, that's what I enjoy the most. Um, and young grain can be a bit difficult. And I have to say, I have no idea how old what goes into coffee grain grain is uh, again what actually that means because grain in the, in the scotch industry is pretty well defined as being different to single malt but coffee grain it could just be that it's done in the coffee still as opposed to being uh the, the, the reflective of the mash bill um but you know like lot loman's uh single grain whiskey that's made from 100 percent malted barley it might be the equivalent of that i don't actually know what coffee grain from nicker is as such but i just know that it's absolutely delicious but to it me it tastes good. like a classic well-aged single grain scotch um but it's it, it's really good value and that is delicious but only if you really like grain whiskey here's a here's a coffee still it's but they, so the grain is produced with not 100 percent barley whereas the malt is mm. barley i think as um just to kind of come back to flavor notes on this one as well the the nicker it has a much more malt led flavor for me to that first one that first one was that real grain kind of cereals uh, kind of sweet corny almost like like you said earlier vin like the kind of chemically flavor whereas this has got a much smoother much fuller it, it reminds me of like when, when people like uh, Ockentosh and say it's a breakfast whiskey. It's kind of got that malted barley kind of like, yeah. like the best cereal. I'm not allowed to drink whiskey before I go to work, but if I was, I'd <laughs> probably drink something like this. Definitely. Um, talk, looking at the time, um, what do you think about moving on to something a little bit more special? Yeah. So um, I, I think, I can't remember what we agreed. Did we agree the, uh, the Tim yeah, was nice? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so next up um, is the, uh, I want to say the oldest, but it's the only one with an actual, the, sorry, there's two with an age statement, but it's out of the two age statements, it's the oldest one. We don't know what's in the phenomenology or the uh, double barrel, but this is the Douglas Lang Timorous Beastie, 18 years. So uh, if I'm right, this is a uh, Highland blend, right? Yeah, Timorous Beast is a Highland blend. I think on the card, does it say roughly what goes into it? I think it might be. It does. Let me, uh, let me have a little read. I don't often do this sort of thing. Um, it's uh, Blair Athol, Dalmore, Glengoyne and Glengarry, which is yeah. awesome. It's a good pedigree, right? Um, I think so. This is for me, like moving on to what I started out saying when we, when we begun. So the first two for me are more like your classic blends. They're, we've got a classic cheap blend which is good for a cheap, like bang for your buck when it's 17 pounds, like what do you expect? But it's palatable. Um, and certainly it sounds like you'd enjoyed it more than you enjoyed Johnny Walker Red um, or your your special Game of Thrones one. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, was, was it possible for him to enjoy it any less than Johnny Walker Red? <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest with you, I, I, going back to the White Walker again, I think that is uh, akin to the Red. Um, it's not the worst whiskey I've ever tried, but it is in my terrible whiskey playlist on YouTube. There is one, you know, so if, if you get bored at the end of this stream and you want to go and check that out, there I do have a playlist of terrible whiskey that I plan on keep adding to. I'm yeah, it's, really like to try terrible things. It's but, Fujikai in there. Fujikai is, is not the most watched one in there, but it is yeah, literally... It deserves to be the most watched one because it is the most terrible whiskey I've ever had. I, I can't believe they can even call it whiskey because if I didn't know any better, I would say it isn't. I would say it's more like sake or something like that. It's a barrel aged sake. Or a, a whiskey that's accidentally being mixed with tyre based juice. <laughs> like, the, if you look at any list of faults, so have you seen these um, tasting sets where you can smell all the different flavours that go into whiskey? Yeah, There's yeah one, one, of them's, one of them's called decay, isn't it? 
yeah one of them is called decay yeah and there's like faults so there's like all the things i hate like sulfur and one of them's in there's like burnt rubber uh i think i said something like wet dog and plim soles what we you know call them like little gym shoes and i just i can't believe that it passed any quality control whatsoever i, I really don't get it i think i think they were genuinely going for which how can we make this the worst whiskey in the human like possible just combine all of those worst flavors and oh. then it will sell bucket loads because you can't even buy the stuff at auction it's so expensive but that's the thing and that's what i said at the end of my video of that one i've been going really off piece here but I, I said at the end of it i was like i implore you to try and find a dram of it because until you try it you do not understand what terrible whiskey is you know it really bugs me when people say oh yeah i like like i tried like glymphitic 12 and i won't i won't touch that it's so crap and i was like that isn't crap it might be a touch boring sometimes but it isn't crap <laughs> I was like, try Fujikai, and then you'll know what crap whiskey tastes like. <laughs> but yeah, so we have the Timorous Beastie 18 years. Uh, I did cover the um, bog standard blend, and this is the same but aged 18 years. And it's just got the most incredible nose. Absolutely incredible nose on it. It's, uh, I mean, I don't get too much Dalmore on there. I get quite a lot of Glen Goyne. Knowing Glen Goyne quite well, I, I get a, a fair amount off that. The thing to bear in mind with the Glen Goyne here is like Glen Goyne, when they do their own stuff, sherry it a lot. All right, yeah. they use sherry cask a lot. So some of the Glen Goyne, um, we were up in Glasgow, Rob and myself, we went on a little bit of a five day trip to Scotland. And we we're actually going to Campbelltown, but we flew to Glasgow first. And then um, we popped in to see David, um, who's a lovely gentleman from Douglas Lang, you'll see him at the whiskey festivals here in the UK and probably elsewhere in, in Europe. He, he does a lot of traveling, like everyone in the on that side of the whiskey train. Kindly like hosted us at Douglas Lang. We tried Glen Goyne, I think it was 10. Um, and theirs is just done bourbon cask only. So it hasn't gone near sherry and it was really, really different. It's like very fruity, which you would recognize as being, um, oh, I'm gonna give a shout out to Eric because I think he just bought you a dram bin. Cheers, Eric, on Vin's behalf. <laughs> yeah, I did just see that pop up. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, thank you very much for, for that little pledge there. Um, he's been, if you follow uh, Eric's um, comments, he's always uh, little jokes, like um, going back to what he said here. He said, the worst whiskey fault is an empty bottle. Can't argue with that. <laughs> Can't argue with that. But yeah, thank you very much, Eric. You're an absolute legend. Hopefully I'll catch one of your streams soon. But um, I seem, they seem to be always too late for me, unfortunately. But I will. What were you saying there, Chris? Go on. I, I've lost track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Glen Goyne. So the Glen Goyne, we actually did... The Glen collection was last month, wasn't it, in, in the Dram team? So since we last live-streamed, I think we did the Speyside one? Yeah. It may have been in the Speyside one. It may have been in the... Uh, well, actually, no, I think we did the Island and Isla, or Hi Island Fling, with the, the mysterious Ardmore in there. But... Um, yeah, so we had a Glengoyne nine-year-old, and so we tried the Glengoyne ten-year-old recently in Scotland from their provenance range. It was really different how Glengoyne do their own things, but this, I think, I believe that the um, in the Timorous Beastie they do do quite a lot. There's quite a lot of sherry influence in it. Mm. Well, I was going to say the same thing about Dalmore as well. Uh, I recently covered an independent bottling of Dalmore from Chieftains. And it's just it's everything that you don't get from a core release of Dalmore. You know, like it, it's just such an incredible whiskey. And Dalmore takes a proper bashing, especially off people like me, who uh, I mean, I, I've got a real soft spot for the 12, but I just cannot pay that sort of money for the rest of their range. Uh, but they the independent bottler was was absolutely incredible. Um, and they just they just don't need to color it like they do uh, or add anything else to it. It's just awesome. But this is I mean, I'm assuming it's no coloured, no added colour, but I don't know that for a fact, to be honest. Yeah, the, the remarkable regional malts is all, the whole range, top to bottom, is non-chill filtered, no colour. I think Douglas Lang is kind of pretty much, you know, probably with the exception of something like King of Scots, they do that pretty much across the whole range, as far as I'm aware. Um, but, yeah, what I started out saying like this is like, so we started with some what, what classic blends, so they're like a cheap blend, we've got a more expensive blend, but that could compete with a single malt. I would certainly say that Nika blended is better than some crap single malt. Um, now, this for me is just a, a shining example of why people who think that blends can't be good, and they do exist. I, I, I don't think they're that common amongst actual 
kind of educated single malt drinkers. Um, it's just a classic example of why it's meaningless. Like the category of blend in no way defines something as being lower quality to a single malt because it's just packed full of 18 year and older single malt from fantastic distilleries. So thanks, shout out to Brandon, he's given me some good advice here on getting hold of Blair Atoll, which I don't think I've actually tried as a single malt. I don't even know who owns it or who releases it. So I'll be doing some looking into that, um, see if we can get it in a box in the future. Um, we've had an idea for a while knocking around. Um, the Glen Collection started out this way of doing like a distillery as you probably haven't drunk box, which would just be a mix of uh, things like Blair Atoll and other distilleries that don't normally come out that much as single malt. Um, but yeah, it's just packed full of like fantastic single malts and all blended means is that, well, first of all, there's malt from more than one distillery, so not single. That's essentially what blended means is not single, as in not single distillery. Yeah. And obviously it can sometimes mean that there's grain or, well, blended scotch, it means there is grain, but blended malt, it is still all single malt whiskey. So all you've done is take casks of single malt and mix them together which is exactly how single malt is made it's just all made from one distillery um so if you consider it something like a chef it's like having you know a master blender someone like douglas lang wherever does it there and i don't actually know who that is um but they've got not just their own distilleries excellent casks to play with but they've got all this stock and douglas lang has immense stock and bottling contracts going back half a century that are incredibly in their favor <laughs> um like they've got that whole smorgasbord of distilleries to pick from to build a whiskey that they think is great. They're not limited to just one distillery, which in a way would suggest that blended malts could be better than single malts. Because most single malts will have hundreds, if not thousands of casks in them in their core expressions. Um, so I think that that for me is like the overall, my overall kind of position on why taking a narrow-minded view on blends is stupid because blends can mean anything and we'll see that more as we go through the final few drams that it doesn't people think of it as just being some kind of mishmash of lower quality barrels or something. i don't know what it is that people yeah. say that they don't like blends think but like to me um if you understand what it really means technically it is a me it's almost a meaningless category distinction from single malt if you have the transparency to understand what's actually in it and that this is a great example of that because we've got what was the list of distilleries i've, I've switched screens uh, but yeah down more glen goyne and glen geary yeah I think banging whiskeys from every single one of those so why not mix them together and create a new product that's brilliant in its own right absolutely I think what's <laughs> interesting about the uh the Doug Lang stuff, especially the remarkable regional mots, is that idea that it's it's vatted, they're vatted single mots. So they really, like you say, you're taking whiskies and your inherent purpose is to create something that tastes like a region with those so that it has those explicit qualities, which is really interesting. I mean, like when Vin's when Vin's nosing it and saying, right, well, I can smell, I can smell Glengoyne. I can smell Dalmore. I can, it's got that, it's, it's really, it's what's great about this whiskey is it's evocative of those drams and almost, as you said, Vin, better than the drams themselves. Like Dalmore, I completely on the same page as you. Dalmore is, it's the stuff they, I don't know how they managed to produce. I'm sure the liquid is great, but the, what they're putting out is just, I'm going to say it, crap. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure, like, I mean, like, a great example is the uh, Alexander Three, right? It's, um, it's, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's wonderful, but on principle, I'll never spend that sort of money on something that's, um, just so uh, unruly, unruly produced. You know, it's, um, it's so unnatural for what they've done. Um, it's just too expensive for me to try. Then if I've got some sirens coming through there, um, Eric actually put, asked an interesting question about uh, blends. He said. Do you think the weakness of some blended whiskies is too high a percentage of grain whiskey? And I would say uh, my immediate reaction would have been to say yes, but I had some time to think about it. Um, it's it's not the grain whiskey, it's the young grain whiskey, the unaged grain whiskey. Uh, and we, I've covered some uh, some grains. In fact, I just did one fairly recently. Wait, you need to just read in my answer to him and uh, elaborating on it. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. Yeah. Oh, uh, have you actually replied to him, have you? I just said I would agree with that, particularly if it's young. Oh, okay, yeah, I've only just seen that. So it looks like I'm copying Great, I think what can we say? But, um, I just covered a 58-year-old grain. 
from uh, Douglas Lang. It was um, absolutely incredible. It was North British, the first ever actual commercial release they've done. And uh, DL have helped them with it. But um, just superb, absolutely superb. Clearly, I'm never going to suggest that anybody spend £1,700 on a bottle of whiskey. It, it isn't really worth that, let's be honest. It's it's no better than something that's like 20 years. But it was it was an incredible thing to drink. And I'm so grateful to be able to have tried that. Um, I think this is on the same lines, you know, like for, for me personally, as incredible as this 18 year old is, I would rather have two bottles of the of the standard release than plump up for the 18. But um, I'd, it's an, oh, I'd, I'd guess, right, I'd, I'd add to your like uh, Douglas, like the kind of general Douglas Lang feeling here that that if you're someone who hasn't tried a grain, any of your followers who haven't tried a grain whiskey that they enjoy, Doug Lang make great single cask or small batch uh grain whiskey that they can definitely try and would get on board with we have a local shop um here in bath who uh called independent spirit if you're ever visiting bath the southwest region independent spirit are an amazing uh, little shop and they had their own bottling uh, a douglas lang bottling grain and it was about 35 pounds uh, and it was absolutely exceptional it was a really great drinkable grain and it had all of those kind of lovely creamy cereal fruity qualities that you get without any of that horrible kind of alcoholic chemically weirdness and i guess it's just care and age it's care in how you bottle it and and i think grain again like blended whiskey you're kind of getting off track but but it has got that kind of like bad and and, and i know chris is uh, as a dram team is a massive advocate of of grain whiskey Hmm. Yeah, I definitely am. It's a real sweet spot for me. But I do like some sweet whiskies, and grain can be quite sweet. Uh, I also love American whiskies, and it's got some of the same characters that you get there in terms of the vanilla and the caramels and toffees and stuff. And that's what I love about grain. But it is distinctly different from some traditional single malt scotch. So um, it's I think it's a personal preference thing. How old was the one from that you were just talking about, Rob, from Indie Spirit locally? Yeah, I, I'm trying to rack my brains to kind of come back to how old it was. But I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. It was definitely less than ten years old. I'd have to do a little bit of research on on what it was. But, but yeah, maybe I can try and find it and put a little link on the on the chat. Yeah, definitely do that. Um, yeah, a couple of people are sort of talking about uh, some blends that they that they do and don't like. One of the things that's coming up is Cutty Sark. Um, interesting one because. Uh, it, although it's Scotch, doesn't really get sold that much in the UK. It mostly goes abroad. Um, and I haven't tried it for quite some years, but I remember it being not too bad. But I think that might be because I was on my uh, honeymoon all-inclusive and it was like the only whiskey they had. So I, maybe I just got desensitized to it while I was there. Um, but I, I've been meaning to get a bottle of that for like the last five or six years to review it on the channel and haven't really been bothered to. So uh, maybe my taste have changed now, and maybe I won't like it. But it's something I'm willing willing to go for. I don't know if you two have tried that. Which one was that one? Sorry, the, the cutty sock. I was too busy chatting away. <laughs> <laughs> no, good. Yeah, I, well, I, was, I was just tempted to try it just because people have been. It's like when people tell me how bad Fujikai was. I'm like, I've got to try it now. <laughs> like, uh, if that happens much more, if, so it's weird that if someone tells me a dram is amazing, I definitely want to try it. If someone tells me a dram's all right, I'm like, yeah, I'm not that first. But if someone tells me it's really bad, I probably want to try it more than any of the others, which is stupid. <laughs> but, um, yeah, well, I'm exactly the same. It's that morbid curiosity that makes people go and watch horror films, isn't it? But um, I mean, I, I'm not that because I can't get to sleep at night if I watch horror films. But um, I can sleep at night if I drink lots of whiskey. So I'll stick with the drinking terrible whiskeys. <laughs> But blended whiskies is a funny one because it's um I, I don't know about your your you guys parents but my parents always have a, a collection of blended whiskies in their cabinet when I go home and and Cutty Sark is one of the ones that that they will always drink Cutty Sark and Black Bottle both uh, blended whiskies I'd never think about buying personally but both they always have in their collections and it is like you say it's those people who and God forbid again I'm ruining your channel but they put coke in their whiskey like people don't want to spend a bunch of money and then put 
coke in it but they like that as a drink and it's something that they want to drink and something that that's kind of the way they drink it and i think kind of well if we can find something where you can drink it neat and you can put coke in it and enjoy it is, is that sacrilegious or is that a good thing well see my standpoint on mixers is that i mean i i don't mix my drinks i i, I haven't really found the point of it because either you don't like a whiskey so you have to mix with it so then what's the point um or it mix something that you actually like or you don't want to so i, I don't do it but that said i but, always have a bottle or two in the cabinet for people that do want that so that an argument against, an argument against that is like cocktails if you yep. go to a bar like we have in bristol we have hyde and they make absolutely exceptional whiskey cocktails but un unless that whiskey that goes in there is of high quality is it going to be as good a cocktail? Like, I, d I don't know that. So it's an interesting... I think um, the true artistry of being a good cocktail maker is exhibiting the actual flavours of the whiskey within the cocktail. Yeah, and, and the, the finely crafted ones are the ones that are best. Um, there's uh, been a couple of comments on here as well, like uh, Brandon Lee, who I don't think I said hello to. Hello, Brandon Lee. He says, uh, I still buy cheap blends sometimes when I feel like romantic slumming. And I get that. You know, I like having something cheap around as like a palette resetter. Something that I know, like uh, Glenfiddich 12 is a great example. Always like to have that around because it's it, it, it's it doesn't blow any of your taste buds away and it wakes them up ready for something else. But it, I won't end my night with it. Um, and having the, the bottom stuff is is worth having. Like Travis says, hashtag bottom shelves matter. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That's a that's a proper good category. You need to get a category of reviews of like a bottom shelf dram, <laughs> the well, one that you. The one that you're mildly embarrassed of, but still having your collection because you like it. Yeah, I mean, I, I've I've been covering a lot of really really cheap stuff recently, like a lot of Aldi whiskies and things like that. Um, and a lot of people are enjoying those videos, but I've, a couple of my regulars have, have messaged me saying, "Dude, have, have you actually got anything that's worth looking at?" Um, <laughs> and I was like, "No, honestly, I have. I'm just covering some stuff on the run up to Christmas. You know, stuff that people are actually going to watch." But um, so in response to that, I've just done four straight age statement classics in a row just to appease my usual watchers. So uh, I'm going to a 12. If, if people can't, if your subscribers can't get uh, on board with Bunner 12, they need to be. Uh, can you unfollow? Can you make someone unfollow you? Can you oh, communicate them? No, I can. Actually, a true story. I did have a comment the other day that was um, was really good. Uh, the, the guy, uh, it was good feedback, to be fair. He said, um, that my review was really basic and my tasting notes weren't worth uh, talking about. And I sort of thought I was a bit a bit annoyed, but I thought I'll reply to him anyway. And I said, um, I said, look, you know, it, this is no nonsense whiskey. This is five minute videos. I haven't got time to go into uh, tropical fruits and uh, and steeped prunes and things like that. The people who want who watch me want to know uh, it's it's thirty quid. Is it worth that? It's forty quid. Is it worth that? And that's what I do. I go. Tasting note, tasting note. Yeah, it's worth it. No, it's not. Job done. Video over. And then I said, you know, if you if if you want that kind of thing, that's fine. You're not going to get it here, but go and check out these channels because I know other people do that. You know, they they want to like Ralphie spends half an hour talking about one whiskey, and I I can't do that. That's not. I'm not as experienced as him, and that's fine. So if he wants that, there you go. So yeah, like, I did put that person off me and onto somebody else. But I don't think anyone's got time for that. Who has time? A half hour, like I struggle to make half an hour free for anything. Well, I was going to say that, but like, don't don't knock it too much because this is a two-hour stream, so we want people to stay around for that. <laughs> well, it's a matter of priority. I'm at work right now, Vin. That's <laughs> true. Yeah. No, you could say it's work, but um, this it's uh, it's definitely it's still in the hobby mentality for me. But I guess you guys are. Uh, well, I don't know what. What do you reckon, Rob? Do you reckon it's at work for you? Yeah, absolutely not. I am a primary school teacher. <laughs> this is <laughs> yeah. this is my way of relaxing at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, we're at home with... just just before we move on, because I reckon we're going to move on soon. Oh, yeah. I just want to say that I think the timorous the timorous beastie at eighteen years is a really interesting study in what what makes uh, kind of like a or can make a, a blended malt really interesting because the timorous beastie itself, I don't think, is actually that is not massively sherried to me whereas i think this 18 has that much more kind of christmasy spice to it that might be something that that people are really interested in so i, I know you said earlier that you thought the timorous beastie which, which i agree with is a really great whiskey 
you prefer two of those than one of these. This has just got that, it's got an extra dimension to it. I think it's got yeah. that spice that, that Timorous Beastie doesn't have. And I think for someone who loves a sherry dram, this might be a real kind of like a sort of really decent sidestep from a Highland malt. And then, and just, yeah, another great example of why the dram team is amazing. A whiskey you wouldn't get to drink, but but get the chance to. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I was looking at the price point of things. I, I couldn't remember it. So it's about 80, 85 pounds. Yeah. I, I actually agree it's high. Um, because Not for an 18 yard whiskey though, right? Yeah, well, if you look at the single malts in it, most of them retail about 80 pounds. Like if you were going to say 18 or Glengoyne, about 80 quid. Um, same for some of the others. I don't know if there even is a Glengarry 18. Um, and Blair Atelier, as I said, I know nothing about. But like, it, it's about the right price point for an 18 year old whiskey, and it has a great pedigree. And again, I'm actually just falling afoul of my own, the, the, bi the exact bias that I was just ranting about earlier, which is that something in my head is telling me that because it's a blend, it needs to be cheaper, but clearly that's not true. Um, but I think it is an absolute banging dram. Like that for me is a significant upgrade on the on the standard one. And just, just for people watching, um, the way that I pick the whiskies for the box is really just six whiskies that I want to drink. I'm not particularly expert in whiskey. I'm not that long into my own whiskey journey, about three years properly. Um, it was inspired by me getting into whiskey from whiskey tasting events and realizing that maybe I could put that in a box and, and do something with it. And I hadn't actually really properly sampled this too much BC18 yet, but that really impressed me. I did really enjoy it. As a general rule, I won't buy anything over 50 unless it literally blows my socks off. But um, that one, I'd be very happy if I came upon a bottle of it at a good price. Yeah, absolutely. I, can't, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, before we move on, uh, I don't know if you want to talk about what's over your uh, right shoulder. I guess, is it your right shoulder? From here? Well, I, what I want to do, I don't really want to talk about it in detail. Yeah. Basically, uh, I'd be really interested to hear what people in the comments say. And the problem here is slightly, I see we've got a lot of people from different countries. Mm -hmm. And I would love to send you whiskey in the post at an affordable price, but it is nigh on impossible, um, particularly America and Canada. But just everywhere, the shipping, you just can't ship it cheap enough or legally. Like people just won't take spirit strength alcohol in meaningful amounts. And by meaningful amounts, it actually means the total amount of liquid, I mean the number of containers. Um, so I've been thinking for it as since we started, how could I do international stuff? And I still haven't really cracked it, but I do keep thinking about it. So I'll keep working on it and I'm hoping to do a few things soon that might help with that. But I want to talk about, just ask people's opinions who are, who are listening along about advent calendars. So um, I've been trying to wrap my brains in it. How can I make, I think advent calendars for whiskey are quite expensive. They start here in the UK at 150 for, for what isn't a hugely overwhelming um, lineup of whiskies they're, they're good whiskies like you wouldn't be disappointed but for me i feel like for 150 quid you should probably be getting more or that calendar should be cheaper but the thing is because it's a relatively unique product um they can afford to to charge for it and they target people well with uh, in terms of who they sell it to but they still manage to shift ten thousand units of course i'm referring to master of malt for anyone that hasn't picked up on that uh, and they're great. Their drinks by the dram service is brilliant. It's pretty different to what we do um, in that it allows you to pick all your own. I use it sometimes if I want to try things or if I want to really try an expensive whiskey without uh, bankrupting myself. Um, but I've been thinking for a while, how can I do a calendar? And the problem we have is we don't have a big enough audience um, to, to mass produce it. We'd need to sell at least 250 really guaranteed in order to even bother producing them. And even then, an order of 250 means the materials going into it and stuff would be quite expensive. So what you see behind me um, is something I had made. I'm going to try and see if I can get the camera a bit closer. We're going mobile. No, I'm, hopefully I'm not going to unplug myself. Oh, there's a zoom of my balding head. So what you'll see here, so this is, this is handcrafted by a lady off a, a website called Etsy. So in the UK, Etsy is a craft marketplace for like people who do little home businesses and craft so she made this bespoke for me and i was absolutely blown away by it it is stunning like it is a beautiful piece of work um just the, like the details of, of how she's crafted it like the little barrels there you can see um we've got some dram team logos she's put in a lot of scottish imagery um what else have we got 
Yeah, so you can just see the amount of care and love that has gone into to making that. Now, the problem is, obviously, a hand-sewn calendar is much more expensive, you've lost me now, um, than a box. Like, the boxes you can get for about three or four pounds, like an album calendar box with the little tabs you'd open. If you bought, say, a thousand of them, you could get them for like three or four pounds each. Um, so they're much more affordable, but the problem is you then have to mass produce them in order to make them because uh, you have three or four thousand boxes, which is, you know, well, a thousand or more boxes that you a lot. Um, so you need a massive audience to make them in the first place. Um, so what I've been thinking about doing is like, I want to try and find a way to do an advent calendar that makes it more affordable for people and, and makes it what people want. Because I don't think everyone wants a 150 pound calendar filled with whiskies that are kind of typical I, I don't know what the word i would use is for what goes into the 150 pound version but it's not yeah it's probably a little bit of a step below what we try to put in our boxes a bit less diverse um i would say it's still great stuff there's some cracking whiskies in there but i think for the real single malt fans out there it's probably not gonna get their engines revving so mm. The idea with something like this is it can be produced in really small amounts. So the, the actual calendar would cost me at least £25, or more like 30 probably, to buy from this lady. Now I'd pretty much sell that on at cost to the customer, and then we would fill it with whiskey. So the question is, if you had a calendar like this, whether it was a box or whether it was a, this kind of really ornate, hand-stitched um, piece of art behind me, what would you want in um, an advent calendar, like uh, as whiskey fans? And what would you want it to cost, ideally, you know, within the realms of reality? <laughs> uh, in the, I'll, I'll tell you, like, it costs us about um, £1.50 for the liquid at the bottle, the labelling and everything else that goes here without including the label. Uh, so the labour included to produce it. So our sets cost us genuinely about £22.50. No, sorry, £17.50 to produce. Mm -hmm. And we sell them at twenty seven fifty, and we we have to take VAT off, so we make about a five or a box. So, um, but the whiskey cost alone in that is about eight pounds. Um, so, while six pounds a dram that you'll pay for the calendars on the marketplace at the moment to me seems a lot. I, I want to know what do people want? Do you want to pay more and get better whiskey? Would you rather have whiskies that were 10 mil or 15 mil, so half measures, and be able to actually drink that every day a bit? Like, so a, whisk, a calendar of, have you got a six dram bottle? You can, I've got one here, look. So these are our six drams and they're 10 mil. So it's what you get at a festival if you've got a little sample from a festival stand. But is that interesting to people to try that for 24 days? Because you could make that loads cheaper, loads cheaper, or put loads better whiskey in. But what do people want? What do people want from an advent calendar is really the question, because I'd like to try and make one next year uh, and make it available to people. And with one like this, the advantage would be you buy it year one and get your material calendar. The next year I can just send you the bottles in little bits of tissue paper so they're anonymous and you can get your advent calendar way cheaper because you get basically a refill um, without paying for the calendar. But yeah, I'll be interested to know what you think, Vin, what you think, Rob, and what anyone in the the comments has to say about um, advent calendars. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of comments come in. Um, Dom, who uh, we met at the Bristol Festival, I don't know if we were all three behind the stand then, but um, he's uh, said it's too expensive for him. So that's a good good thing to talk about there, um, is uh, how, your, your main drive is to make it cheaper, right? Um, McCallum Fine and Rare says uh, a good idea, but he doesn't like drinking every single day. Again, we have said something about smaller bottles. I, I thought maybe um, it depended on which way you wanted to do it. You could either reduce the cost or have better whiskies by maybe having a half calendar, you know, like a, a 12 a twelve envelope calendar or a instead of a 24. Every other one is just water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the hydration calendar, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the that, the same. Possibly advent whiskey calendar, yeah. Can, can, I, uh, can I please promote the uh, whiskey and chocolate calendar? So one, one day is whiskey, the next day is chocolate. I mean, oh, I like that idea, actually. I think mean, that's a cracking idea. Yeah. Because uh, I, I, genuinely, I genuinely agree. Like, <laughs> as much as we all love whiskey, drinking it every day becomes a little bit like a chore. Like, if you've ever caught up with Ben Bowers and his... Uh, <laughs> 365 whiskies in a oh, year like like when i chatted to ben about it like at first when i first saw it i thought 
wow, this guy's trying to raise money by drinking whiskey every day. That sounds like the easiest and the best way of making money for charity I've ever heard of. <laughs> and then you actually chat to him and he's like, it was like, it was laborious. I had to like, like give up bits of my life to do this. And then you're like, okay, so there is an element where not drinking every day is actually positive. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I mean, I've spoken to Ben at length. Um, uh, he started just before me, really, uh, doing his channel. So we, we get on really well now. But he, um, you know, he, he didn't just drink a whiskey every day, right? He he had to do all this research for it because he was like sitting there pinging up maps and doing this. And each video was like 15 minutes long that he then had to then go put through an editing software to put the overlay and get this video every day. That's the other thing about it. So he, he set himself some really stringent rules about only have only doing three in a day and only doing five days in a row and things like that it was i'm, I'm surprised he did it and I'm, I'm not surprised at all that he isn't doing it anymore um but he got a job uh gordon mcphail on the back of it so yeah, uh, he, he almost deserves that job for the effort that he put in, in that year. Making, yeah making the videos for me like <laughs> 365 days i'd be like oh, okay if i have to i'm just gonna <laughs> make myself do it and enjoy it but like, even if some days we're going to bed, just necking a whiskey immediately before going to sleep. But like the video editing, goodness me, I couldn't, <laughs> that was the thing for me. It's like, golly. Yeah. At, at The Real Dram, we uh, barely manage uh, a whiskey, a written whiskey blog a week. I don't know how Vin does it, producing two high quality video, where video wow. reviews a week. It's, it's why we're not on YouTube, that and the fact that I've got a face for radio, but it like it, it it's a real effort and that, but I, I agree with I, it's interesting in the comments and be really interested in that's pricing that makes people is it that they're paying money for something they don't know because someone's mentioning your uh we i don't know if we're allowed to say it out loud should i cover my voice and say that smws calendar just in well, case uh, hello on the um courtesy so we've got a, a friend of mine and dram team founding member like you but uh, been in fact john watkinson's there in the comments so i don't know oh, if he... i've missed his comments sorry uh, yeah we've, we've been chatting a little so uh john is on most social channels as i think jw baseman i believe you play the bass guitar john uh, i think that's where it comes from <laughs> unless i'm making it up uh but john was a founding member of this the dram team he signed up for a year and a launch um so he's dear to my heart and we've met a few times at whiskey festivals and whatnot I mean, exchanged emails, but most recently we worked together a little bit because uh, the Dram team made an advent calendar of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. So much as I can't, I don't have the audience to go and make 250 or 500 because I couldn't guarantee I'd sell them. And it's a heck of a lot of whiskey to be left with unsold. And because they're seasonal, people look to, they want a new one every year, right? So if you make spare one year, you can't necessarily sell them the next. It's a bit tricky. Um, the SMWS have 10,000 members in the UK. So we made 250 units for them. Um, and that was sold at 150 quid. Now that was exceptional value because it's single cask whiskey, every dram, cask strength, straight as it comes out of their, their cask. And they didn't hold back on the quality of the yeah. whiskey they put in, in terms of the distilleries and the age statements and stuff like that. So it really was an amazing product for 150 pounds, which we were glad to have been a part of. It was a big project for us bottling uh, 7,000 whiskeys to go in. Um, <laughs> but John did the photography, so you might have seen some of the stunning images of that red Scotch Malt Whiskey Society calendar. So John did that. Um, so kudos to John for his amazing f photographs of whiskey. Follow him on Twitter to see more. Um, JW Baseman, B A S S M A N. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, okay, well, doesn't it? But that calendar was a cracking example of what could be done differently. They obviously took the position we'd rather do it at good value than charge people, you know, above what's necessary for it because if you look at the quality of what was in the SMWS calendar versus the existing calendars on the market it was way above it it was way above it single cast whiskey from those distilleries at those ABVs and, and and that age the age range that they had remarkable product so that's the kind of thing I'd rather do um but you know they're in the luxury position of having the whiskey in the cask which means that it's much more affordable for them so they just took the view we're not going to go out flat out for profit we're going to flat out to promote our whiskies and maybe we'll sell a lot more whole bottles on the back of it um again not something that i would get out of it so maybe we can look um we, we first of all i think before i was gonna say we should look at the comments about advent calendars i'm really intrigued and hopefully i can kind of download this conversation afterwards but we should probably start talking at least a little bit about the, the next whiskey as well or we're gonna yeah, yeah. 
So uh, it was on, on the tip of my tongue. We were going to move on to it. But um, the next one, okay, I'll just go straight into it. Uh, when I said right at the beginning of the stream, anyone who's managed to stay this long so far, congratulations. Um, I, I said this one's a, a bit of a cheap blend um, because it's a teaspoon blend, right? So it's technically, by all intents and purposes, a blend, but realistically, it's a 0.01% single malt whiskey with a, with, you know, a, on top of something else. But this is the Boutique Whiskey. Focus, please, camera. Uh, Boutique Whiskey Blend Number Four Batch One. I, I wish I had a bottle here to show you because the, the artwork on these things is stunning. Um, I'm going to send people a link. Hang on, I'm just going to go to the chat comment. So yeah, that's a link in there. To the website I just fired into the chat. But Vin, for those uh, of your comment, the full image of the label there and get the taste notes and whatever else. Vin, for those of you, your uh, followers and commenters who are a little bit like me, what what is the point of a teaspooned malt? Like, I don't really. What? Why would you take a malt and then add a teaspoon or something else to it? Can I jump in and answer this, Vin, or are you going to do it? Well, <laughs> I, I don't mind saying a bit. Though. I was just going to say you can tell Rob's the teacher because he uh, he 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 clearly knows the answer, but leads conversation really well. <laughs> um, my understanding of a teaspoon uh blend is um a you can you can get a barrel off off uh, any distillery who's willing to sell you one but let's say for instance i went to glenfiddich and asked them to give me a barrel and they said we don't really want you to but sure why not i'll tell you what we'll do we'll drop a teaspoon of something else in it and now you can't put glenfiddich on this bottle so i could be like this is a no-nonsense whiskey blend but i can't say it's glenfiddich because it isn't it's a blended malt now um that's my understanding of it maybe i'm thinking too maliciously but uh what, what would you say to that chris well i, I was just reading the comments what you're talking i probably didn't take enough of that in so yeah what, <laughs> really, yeah, um, from the very last thing you said like so i've been trying to figure out who this whiskey is from i don't know who's clicked on that link um so i've come across teaspooning originally um from with I think it was Balfeni, uh, and I think it's called Burnside. I'm not 100% certain. So the reason that Balveni do it, or rather William Grant and Sons who own Balveni do it, is because they don't want people to independent. They have casts they can't use in their own product um, for whatever reason, or that they choose to sell, but they don't want to be able to people to bottle them and call them Balveni because they want dominion over that name. So, yeah, I think that's pretty much what you just said. As It's just an example of it, Vin. Um, so they would like drop a, a teaspoon of Glenfiddich into their Balveni, and I think that's what Burnside is. If I, I was talking to Jason B. Standing, as some of you may know, um, he's a really active chap in the whiskey industry over here, and phenomenally knowledgeable about whiskey. Um, and he was, uh, I was asking him about some of this because I think we tasted one with him at a whiskey tasting event recently. Um, so I was trying to, I was actually asking Jason what this he if he knew what this would be. And uh, his his guess was that this was probably um, I'm going to give you a clue. Should we play a little guessing game? This is a clue. Anyone recognise this bottle? This is a whiskey Elsa bottle, Bay. huh? That's not Elsa Bay, is it? It is Elsa Bay. Yeah, it is. Yes. Elsa. Well done. It's missing the slate topper. Well done. <laughs> it makes a great little water decanter. Really stylish. Um, <clears throat> And uh, isn't the whiskey topper, the little slate topper, is also supposed to be made from like a, the same stone as curling stone? Like, or something it, like that, yeah. Is, is anything more it, Scottish yeah. than curling? <laughs> <laughs> that must be. I, um, I did try to keep the, uh, the really impressive slate cork, but with the water in the bottle, it just started getting um, mildew, unfortunately. So I'm left with just the bottle, but it's still very nice. But what you'll see on the, on the link I sent, if anyone's still reading it, um, is it says similar to blended malt number one and number three this is once again hardly a blended malt at all this time it's almost exclusively a single malt from one of our more recently built scottish distilleries that's been teaspooned that's saying in a small amount of another well of single malt's been added so the, the label there that you can see on the page is all about super spoons saving the world and stuff like that it's just a typical kind of quirky boutique label but I couldn't figure out who this was because most of the young distillers I know they're actually releasing whiskey and the boutique would have had a chance to bottle at six years old. I couldn't figure it out. I was like, they all to me it was they would 
I was thinking of like Kill Homer or something like that, and I couldn't quite get my head around who it might be. But Jason uh, reckoned that this might be um, Al Bay. Because Alsa Bay, you may not know this, they only do one single mortal release as it stands. I think they might have just put a new one out, I'm not sure. Um, uh, and it's heavily petered, or certainly petered. Um, is a bit of a whiskey Charlie in the Chocolate Factory setup, like Lot Lomond is, and that they have all sorts of different stills, they do all sorts of different stuff, they do grain, they do blended, you know, all sorts of stuff that would go into blends. Um, so Jason's bet was that this was Isle Bay, and for me that would be consistent with the the teaspooning practices that are practiced by um, William and Grant and some with Balvenie and with the, uh, I think also with Glenn Finnick, and then released into other names. So to, to go full circle, it is just to stop someone calling it Isle Bay or anything else. Um, yeah, but sort of this kind of like slight pettiness, like oh, you want a bottle of single malt, do you? Teaspoon, <laughs> like. No, you can't. They're like, licking someone else's food. And they go, I've licked it. You can't eat it now. <laughs> like that. Like, um, but to me, it just typifies like the ridiculousness of the blend category. So this has to be called a blend because it is single malt from more than one distillery. It is a blend. But it is 99.9% one single malt from one distillery. I would defy almost anyone to taste the difference between this before they put the teaspoon in and this after they put the teaspoon in. So it is effectively a single malt, but it by technicality has to be called it. It's a technical blend, is what I would call it. Yeah, uh, and it's. I mean, for me, it's why, it's why going by solely the category name blend is a ridiculous thing to do. It's it's a really interesting one actually, because you with you, I I would never. Jason is a cleverer man than I, and and I would never pick the 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 kind of Elsa Bay connection here. But when you when you know this, it's got a really similar. And it is again. We back to that grain quality again. Like on the nose, I get a real grainy, kind of creamy cereal flavour that actually is really present in Elsa Bay, despite it being a peated malt. And 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 it, yes, it's, it's kind of almost uh, like amazing to me that someone can pick that out. But it's it's good work. Yeah, and I, I mean for me, it's absolutely fabulous whiskey as well. I've I've tried this a couple of times now, uh, and and just, I mean, I, I love boutique stuff anyway because they it's always a decent ABV. This one's fifty three point six, uh, and it's it's just got such a great nose to it. I'm uh, I, I I just greatly enjoy it. It's and it's still available now, which is a rare one. I think it might be because it's a six year old whiskey, and fifty pound for a six year old whiskey puts people off. This this um really reminds me, and I don't know Chris because Chris is the the man for grain, but this has a real like it's like a a really good grain whiskey, that kind of smoky, creamy cereal flavour. I don't know if that's the 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 sweetness for me. That's what I'm a bit of a. I was going to say slut for, which is a bit of a, just an inappropriate word to use on live stream. But well, well, that's what I'm a sucker for. Um, is just the sweetness of a uh, of a grain whiskey and sherry whiskey, sweet sherry whiskey. Maybe it's the grain, but with the smoke. Yeah, yeah. I, I, what I, I think is really interesting. I, I, I like it's mainly here because it's a teaspoon blend, and I find that fascinating. But I do think it's very tasty as well. I certainly notice the punch at the, it's at nearly fifty four percent. So um, that's pretty noticeable. I think it has a real black currant nose to it. Like a real, like a autumnal fruit nose. There's definitely something fruity going on, something juicy going on there. Uh, I've only tried Elsa Bay once, and that was actually through another drum of yours. I did cover that on the channel and was blown away by it. Really, really nice, uh, considering I've never never tried it before. Um, John Watkinson uh, asked this question um, that I thought is, is very interesting, actually. He said, from what I've read and heard, they very often don't even bother with the teaspoon. They just say they did it. Well, that's fascinating. I wouldn't know, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me that much. But well, actually, no. Actually, that would surprise me because the regs are so strict that if that was discovered and someone was then bottling a some a single malt under a blend name, uh, they'd get yeah. quite, they could potentially just get into issues with that. So maybe not. Yeah, the SWA would have something to say about that for sure, wouldn't they? Um, I'm conscious of how much time we'll spend talking of the last two, so I don't know what you think about. Uh, knocking on because uh, we were we were going to do the, the the last one next right because the because the, the next one technically in the box is heavily peated so 
Uh, I would say we should probably go for phenomenology um, above the what well, before the Ardbeg Craig Ellicky that we've got. I think we've temporarily yeah. lost Rob right now. He's muted himself. Um, That's okay. He'll figure it out. <laughs> so I'm going to drop another link into the comments because I think um, I think Rob's coming back. Oh, he's back now. He's back now. Oh, my time. To Sorry, water. gents. I was just grabbing a glass of water. Have we I'm moved on? Grab my compass box bottle. You right that. Yeah. What well, what we're going to do now, Rob, is we're going to try the uh, the weed dram. So um, anyone who wasn't here at the beginning, basically they these drams come in a box like this and uh it's it comes like this so what you do is you get five drams and then a kind of bonus sixth dram and the, the sixth drams are always um i was gonna say they're always incredible i i don't vibe with them all the time but they they're always of, of good quality and good price today we've got the compass box uh phenomenology i think it's phenomenology i think it's pronounced phenomenology yeah so this thing here is uh, a limited release uh, I've written there 150 pounds a bottle. I thought it was 160, but it's 150. Oh, I need to approve Chris's comment because it might be malicious. If I approve it. Um, and the back of the card says that it's uh, it's mostly Glen Lossy with a bit of Tamdu and also some Highland, Highland Park Talisker and Kalila in there. Uh, the good thing about Compass Box, oh, he's got the box, of course. I'm back. I'm back with the box. You can see me, Vin, but no one else can unless I talk. The box, I just wanted to show people because the box is just. Uh, it's really difficult to show it properly, but it's like a kind of work of art by um, who's the famous artist? Is it Dali that paints like the, the melting clocks and things yeah. like that? You've got some really stunning uh, images and extra detail on the box mm. and the bottle too, actually. Interesting that we're now covering art as well in, in our whiskey stream. Oh, I meant to say earlier, actually, that the, the box for the Timorous Beastie, the gift tube, I don't think I have one to hand, but the, it's absolutely stunning. It's got like a lot of red kind of russet foiling on it. It's beautiful. Really nice. Bit of whiskey packaging glamour porn for you. <laughs> like, it's really lovely. Um, I mean, that's yeah, the kind of marketing I like. Um, when I talk about marketing on my channel, I don't like to talk about tasting note marketing because they put all these tasting notes. You will taste this in this whiskey. Well, that's... That's up to me to choose, um, not to be told. But the, um, the the bottles, why shouldn't they be pretty? You know, a, a good example here. I mean, it's it's a gin, so forgive me for doing a gin. But um, I've got a collection of bottles down here. This is uh, forest gin. It's a it's a ceramic bottle, which is annoying because you can't see how much you've got left, and it's quite heavy as well. But it's it's just a stunning piece. And uh, and I'm going to make something of this bottle. I've, I've got a little series planned, a little spoiler alert for you, a little series planned coming up where you can make things out of your bottles. Um, but that's probably going to be next year now. It's taken a lot of work to put that together. Um, but, yeah, but I like I like it when they put a bit of effort into the bottles, whether it's just a standard bottle. Here's a great example. I've had this sitting next to me for a while now. That's just a bottle with a label and, the, and this little sticky thing on there. Uh, maybe I'm biased because it's terrible whiskey, but it it's uh no effort whereas you can put loads of effort into a bottle if you want right so yeah. what i would say about this because I've, I've learned a lot since i started the business about packaging costs so like it you know for me like the packaging cost is pretty important to keep it down because i just want to keep the cost down of sending someone a box and if i'm paying five pounds for the box that the whiskey goes in i'm wasting four pounds that could be spent on whiskey so our packaging, for example, the box that we um, let's play guess. What would you guess that the box that we send you our whiskeys in costs? Is it is it cheating if I know already? <laughs> yeah, it's cheating if you know already. So that what? So so this box here, including all yeah. the putting together of it all, because it's um it's in parts, isn't it? Yeah, well, we pay that separately. So the labour cost of packing is separate. Um, but the actual yeah. raw yeah, box is it, itself is it, is it twenty one pounds and ninety nine pence? <laughs> yeah, that's it. We just if buy it real badly and put rubbish whiskey in. If, if you don't, um, if you don't buy it in enough bulk to get it for less than a pound a box, then I would be very surprised. I'd be probably even less, maybe sort of 50, 40, 50 p, something like that. It's got to be. You obviously got good instincts for packaging costs. Um, it is fifty, just over fifty p for that box, but we buy three thousand at once. So, um. And then we obviously pay quite a lot of storage costs because we don't send out 3,000 in, in less than a fair few months. Um, so 
but I think for the quality of the print and everything like that, it's pretty decent. But like, the thing is, if you look at, I've got an example here, which I've scratched the Louis Vuitton lights out by sliding it across my floor. But this is a Glengoin 21 box. So this is not a spoiler alert because it's already public information on our website. Um, but Glengoin 21 is the six gram for our Christmas box, which features sherry cask grams. And this is an amazing bit of packaging. I can't really show you in this one because it's actually just laden up with the spare whiskey is not the actual original uh, it's got magnets in it like this thing's magnetic and it kind of slides out and grips the bottle and everything about it feels sexy and amazing now that would be expensive i tell you but the thing is when you're selling a bottle of whiskey for 110 120 pounds why not spend three or four pounds more on the packaging like just to make it feel more special a whiskey at that price point should feel special um, or can and, and things like that like certainly things like the gold foiling on some of the compass box stuff It doesn't cost a lot more to add and I think it's worth it to make it feel like a better experience for the people buying the product um, As long as you're not taking it to the to ludicrous degrees I think um just worth like pulling it back into the whiskey as well because we've all got it in the glass I think there's a real there's a lovely like fruity kind of grassy maybe melon or gooseberry it, it kind of has a real a real like it smells like a gooseberry bush if that's a really that's a really specific tasting a smelling note but that kind of like vegetal i think it's i think compass box for me are the ones who you take that category of blended whiskey or blended malt and they take it to a next level it's almost like an art in itself what they've done with the category personally yeah, it's funny you should say about uh, talking about the whiskey. I was going to say just before you said that, um, Noah Blunder was in. Um, I couldn't tell if he was poking at us not talking about whiskey, but he said, "Imagine drinking whiskey," um, and I think that's uh, probably fair to say that we should we should be drinking more whiskey on the on the live stream. But we are we are having a very lively discussion about lots of different topics today as well, which is good. I like it. Uh, I should also I've got my dram team Blencarn in for the sixth round. Always do that for the sixth round. Good to see a drink on on brand, man. On brand. <laughs> I appreciate that. I know, and they genuinely aren't paying me for this, I have to say. So. <laughs> I, mean, I, me. I probably should be good. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so this, uh, this whiskey is just, out, I mean, it, they, they've done it to say it's like a phenomena, but I, it is phenomenal whiskey as well. And so, um, Phenomenology is actually, they'll say, so much as we were just big up compass box and saying, like, this is the sort of marketing you like, they do give a, li there's a little bit of guff on their website about this sort of thing. So, um. I actually, this is in a way a, a valid aim. So it says, we've been long working on a blend of single malts that combine seemingly dissonant flavor profiles, but together create something compelling. We landed on a recipe that elicited a surprising range of reactions and descriptions, each person taking away something different from the whiskey. And so that's why they end up calling it phenomenology, because phenomenology is a school of philosophical thinking about um, how everything is subjective, basically. Um, and you can only experience something from your own perspective. I, I, I know, you, I know you've, you've had a go at them there for that, but that, but like it's this is a really odd, it's an odd whiskey experience in that when I smell, I'm, I'm kind of getting like almost like highlandy, grassy, green notes, and then I taste, and it is completely different. Definitely. Uh, I should just say as well, um, Roy's popped in, Roy Acrovite, and he's uh, donated a dram to me. Thank you very much. Didn't put any comments, though, but I'm wearing his T-shirt right now. It's one of the few I like to wear on my live streams, that and the um, Swally shirt, Stark Side of the Dram T-shirt. But uh, I, I don't need to introduce you all to Roy. I'm sure you everyone knows. If you don't, go and check out his channel. Absolutely amazing quality. But when uh, Rob said earlier that I put out high-quality stuff, I, I really don't. You've got to go and check out Roy if you think I put out high-quality stuff. And then please do come back because I, I, I do enjoy the views. I do enjoy the views. <laughs> like, <laughs> the views. That and the whiskey. That and the whiskey, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm yeah. addicted to easy listening jazz. I'd love that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, something like uh, about this whiskey here, um, someone said to me once when I was making my, um, my Infinity bottle that uh, I shouldn't put too much heavily peated stuff in there because when, when they make blends... They aim for no more than sort of seven percent for of, of really peated stuff. Otherwise, it just overpowers it. So I think this is probably right. I mean, the the Highland Park, the Tasker, and the Kalila in this in small quantities 
very very small like less than a percent three and a half percent between them i think it is so yeah to so me it's really like what rob said like on the nose it's super fruity like glenn lossy we had recently in either the space i box or the the glenn collection i.e the glenn something box um glenn lossy i hadn't really experienced a single more before we had the six dramas the the whiskey exchange exclusive bottling of it which is quite old i think and it was just beautifully fruity like amazingly fruity more than any other whiskey i think I've, i remember trying and this has got a lot of that going on with it but more so on the nose because when you do go into the palate you get that you get that sophisticated peat from the highland park and the other ones that are in there so if anyone who hasn't opened the graphic this is 72 percent glen lossy um which in the graphic it says fresh fruity apples so that's what i'm getting a lot of then there's 24 and a half percent of tamdu caramel oak and spice is what a compass box are attributing to it and then you're looking at two one and a half a percent of highland park talisco and kaolila uh, respectively so a bit like the uh the douglas lang timorous beastly this has got quite a pedigree behind it but it's really intriguing the way they put it together so i, I agree with you on that rob that actually as a whiskey that highlights the sort of two contrasting styles that fruitiness from the first two that make up nearly 97 percent of it and then the savory peatiness from the, the remaining three and a half percent but it's incredibly present for it's how really, little it's, of it it's really is. weird to me it's almost like one and two are on the nose and then three four and five are in the drinking like you get the sherry and the grass from the glen lossy and the tamdu on the nose and then when you drink it's it's all about smoke and peat and salt and yeah i have to agree with that entirely this one of the, i like that in a dram i like the, the, i mean there are times when i like the nose to translate to the palate but i like to be surprised by the difference between the two and the, like you say exactly that this is um the, the major players the major two are all in the nose and the and the, the final parts just really bring it together and uh and and really finalize it with that kind of just just a touch of smoke it's not it's it, no heavy at all if, if you're watching this and you're not a fan of peat then it's this is very accessible for that but i would say uh probably not that accessible for the price but it, it wouldn't be a starting point for peated whiskey put it that way but really good really good yeah it's interesting is there a that's an interesting question is there a, a blend or a cheaper whiskey where you get a similar unique experience not unique obviously that's a stupid thing to use but original like a kind of where you've got where you've got a, a fruity and a malty but you've got peat that comes through it's interesting like i think that's a that's not an experience that you get lightly it's like almost like we had um we tasted a really interesting whiskey recently where it was uh bourbon cask that had been then transferred into isla cask and so it still had some of that the peak but really gentle in the background that was over at glen scotia but that was in their single cask stuff that they had at distillery only but i don't know is it any other any of your commenters wise enough to know these kind of things yeah i mean um chuck it in the comments if you uh, got any suggestions for that by all means uh, that's what we uh, that's what we like to get a bit of this is we've got three people um but it's, it's difficult to kind of get that interaction as well i guess isn't it um I'm actually just super jealous right now because I've noticed that uh, that Chris has got uh, a, a decent wedge in his glass because he's got the bottle, but my <laughs> 10 minute is... I've tried a purposeful policy recently of balancing the six dram to main drams ratio in my favour such that I always happen to end up with about half a bottle of six dram after every production run. Uh, it's like my way of paying myself uh, without paying myself. Absolutely, yeah. I, I've just finished mine and... I'm absolutely stunning. It's one of those whiskies that I can guarantee you I would not have bought with my own money before I tried it, which is the um, the second reason why I'm uh, a fan of the Dram Team. The first is that it, it fully sustains my channel while, while I'm not buying bottles. So uh, I could, if I haven't got any bottles in, I can fall back on any of these samples. Uh, I mean, I do what, like eight, eight or nine reviews a month. So uh, even if I ignore the little one, because I... Traditionally, when I get the box through, I, I neck this one, uh, like basically through the door. I was like, why not? Because so I've heard some people of, of your of your uh, subscribers, if you like, they save these for special occasions. And I think, well, why? Yeah. 
Well, uh, the, the interesting thing about that for me was that I, I kind of think... Are that you the hugging a bottle of whiskey yeah. there? Uh, I've got the next dram, just the box for it. I don't know why I'm holding it so intimately. <laughs> it's because I'm feeling affectionate, having had already had five whiskeys plus the bonus <laughs> Nika from the barrel I drank earlier for science. <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is interesting for me was the feedback I had about the six dram because I thought about scrapping it at one point because, frankly, it's logistically inconvenient to do a, a bottle of a different size. And I was thinking about maybe going down to five and making the fifth one full size, which would actually be more whiskey for the price point because the cost of the six dram means that it would be um, effectively more cost to us to deliver that. But people saw it as something extra and they liked it being small and it was kind of seen as a bit of a USP. And um, so we've kept it. But um, yeah, whether you keep it for special occasions or you, uh, you neck it straight away like you've been, I, d I don't know. I think we may have lost Vin, Rob. Are we in the rare situation? We've, we've got a no nonsense whiskey channel takeover by the Dram Team and Dram Team Superfan slash Real Dram. <laughs> it, it, it is a little bit confusing, but he's either just doing a really dubious yeah, face. He really does not like this Compass Box whiskey. Everyone. <laughs> Look at his face. Should should we move uh, on to another I've whiskey? A, yeah, I've got a little. Uh, I've got a, a WhatsApp message. Is that Vin? Yeah, Vin has sent me a WhatsApp message that says, fuck, I've disconnected. <laughs> oh, sorry, hey, bleep, I, I've disconnected. I, um, I think uh, I think in the absence of Vin, why don't we move on to the uh, the final drum? Hello, everybody. Please. Welcome to this drum team, this drum team live stream. It's nice to have you all here. As you'll see, our channel is quite popular. Over, <laughs> I think we just passed the 2,500 subscriber mark recently, which I'd like to credit to myself. <laughs> no, uh, go on, Rob. I think we should move on. I think let's move on to this one. So we've got a little, we've got a final bottle. And which is interesting, it's that kind of nice thing about your drams is that you do curate a set of whiskey tasting that is intentionally uh, to be drunk in an order and you pack it left to right intentionally. But what's interesting is you can then do your own order. And I saw in the comments earlier that, that one of your uh, newer followers, Kilted Moose, he is... Uh, a fairly recent subscriber and has drunk a few It'd be interesting to know what he drunk first and why I, i'd be interested to know chris oh, uh scott so kilted moose is i think i believe his name is scott and i hope i'm not misremembering that because <laughs> that'd be quite rude of me um but i'm still very much involved in seeing all the orders coming in and, and, and handling customer questions for that so hopefully i remember that correctly um yes yeah, scott if you want to reply in the comments that'd be great um it'd be really interesting to know but let's let's move on to the uh well, i think the, scott joined us like two-thirds of the way through the broadcast so he may have just started with the six tram in fact <laughs> so the, the thing is the problem we have with the order in the box is just a quirk of the shape of the box I, I've, I've got one here somewhere which i can grab in a second but um obviously the six tram has to go on the right hand side so people kind of think oh i should drink it last now the first five we do put in an order that we think they should be drunk in um uh but the six dram always is just on the right so for me like if you are a dram team subscriber and you're here like just drink at the six dram wherever you want to within that order but i don't think a lot <laughs> to be honest i don't think a lot of our subscribers sit down and drink all six in one session anyway so like, a lot of people cancel or ask if we can skip months and things like that because they haven't got through them so i think uh yeah they're not often sitting down for two hours with their virtual internet friends and um and drinking all six in one sitting. How about for uh, keeping up uh, Vin's appearances as a whiskey-based channel? We we crack on to the double barrel Ardbeg Krigaliki, and you explain. Do you do you know why they decided to double barrel something that is like a smoky whiskey and what I would describe as a light fruity whiskey? Is there any reason for that? Well, funnily enough, because we've just had a compass box for non-ology, um, it, it's a similar concept in that they, obviously Ardbeg and Kregelaki are vastly different single malts. And what they've tried to do is make a compelling blend of those two vastly different single malts. Um, I'm going to hang on. I, 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 I have officially poured and it now smells... I'd almost primarily say like an Ardbeg whiskey. So you've got that 
all those noses you'd expect from an Ardbeg. You've got the the kind of smoky meat. You've got the chimney smoke. You've got charcoal in there. I can't smell any Kregelicky. Or maybe the maybe it is in there in the background. It's a funny one to when you first nose a whiskey and you have to kind of let it swill. I'd love to know also, it's one of these things, now we've taken over a whiskey channel, we can ask all the questions we've... <laughs> what I want to do is anyone who hasn't given Vin a, a sponsored Vin a dram, can as many people as possible just sponsor Vin a dram while he's not here, because I think that'd be quite funny for him to come back to. <laughs> just to promote the excellence of his guests. I'm going to super chat. Hang on, how can I... If anyone wants to teach me how to do super chat. Oh, there's a sliding scale. That's... Day. 20 pounds! Jesus. <laughs> uh, so, so interestingly i think you've got a it's an interesting one to nose where you've got the r bag there and then you've also got something in the background that kind of smells m maybe like a strawberry strawberries and cream is that a kregelicky note uh, is that is our bag creamy amongst all the pea maybe maybe it is i don't know it's an interesting one so we've got we've, we've got cream and peat and fruit and smoke am i back and it's almost like we were doing a better job without the channel's host oh my god <laughs> that is literally the most what, embarrassing what, thing ever wait, wait. i'm so sorry to everybody who was watching I, my internet just died on me i have no idea what happened then there actually was quite a buzz in the chat about how it was probably better this way around yeah <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure that will be a real thing Well, we're, yeah, welcome back, Vin. Yeah. There we go. What we started to do, we tried to start a snowball of tips in your absence. Anyway, just, have just, I actually just, had some We chat. need to fund you getting some better internet, Vin. That's what we're doing. <laughs> do, do you know what, right? I, I, I'm not going to moan about my internet too much, but I, uh, for years, before I did started live streaming, I had uh, like one megabyte a second internet, and I paid a big upgrade um, to... Uh, to, to get 30 megs now well i should have fiber but i can't believe that's just dropped out on me i'm going to be giving a a big a big um message to my uh, suppliers later about that but never mind um i yeah, should just say a couple of people uh have given me super chats as well but um that's that's you chris thank you very much hey, um, welcome, hello. and uh, alan the whiskey friends have a drown me so yeah uh, sorry about that folks i will uh Interesting oh, enough, while you were away, Vin, we uh, opened the double barrel and we started uh -huh. nosing to see if we could find uh, at what it, why there was a Ardbeg Kregelicky uh, split. And I, I, I proposed that on the nose it smells primarily like an Ardbeg. And then I pompostulated about that for a while and then I drank it and I was like, whoa, that's not an Ardbeg. <laughs> it's a really <laughs> weird like mix and I feel confused now. So as I said, what I said, Vin, was it, I think to me it's a bit like the phenomenology, which specifically states that it's supposed to be a compelling blend of seemingly dissonant flavour profiles. I <laughs> think that's the exact words, not me being eloquent. Um, but on the, I've just sent a link into the comments about the, um, the Douglas Lang, the, this double barrel. And this isn't always what double barrel is about, I don't necessarily think. Um, but they refer to it. As a perfectly balanced mold that proves that opposites definitely do attract. So it's a similar kind of concept in a way to the phenomenology of putting two things that are really different together and trying to make a compelling whiskey from them. And I think they've succeeded. Interestingly for me, as someone who is cautious as it comes to peat, to me this just tastes like I was drinking hard bag, but um, a softer hard bag is what I would describe it. Yeah, and I mean for me, I just I was noting this earlier, and it's I mean it's obviously heavily peated but there's loads to it there and if you if you're not into your peated whiskies then you wouldn't smell anything else other than the r big in there for sure um but yeah you i mean you, you're right when you said that rob it's it is all r big and it's just a, a probably just a touch sweeter than uh, than the usual r bags i am an absolute r big super fan like i'm the antithesis of chris in that chris loves his creamy boring uh, grassy whiskies and i love i love a big punchy smoky mm. monster of a whiskey this year's our big committee release grooves is one of my favorite whiskies of all time big smoky sweet it's, it's 
But this, like you said, Ben, it, it has got a real weird, not weird, but it is it is hard bag on the palate, but it has got that difference. It's got that creamy, and you and you can get lighter, different hard bags. Hard bag is not a specific beast, and mm. it's interesting. Isla, Isla whiskey is a real, they're absolutely my bag. That's what I'm I'm into. When I was asked to do a whiskey tasting event for our local whiskey tasting group. The thing I wanted to do was drink as much Isla whiskey as possible, <laughs> but I, like this is different. It's it's intriguing, and I guess that again comes back to why blended whiskey is interesting. I know um, Chris might not like me saying this, but we uh, we were once uh, involved in a uh, blending event where Chris created what he create what he claimed was um, the greatest whiskey ever cl- ever created, and. Uh, <laughs> I think when we both sobered up, we realized just how awful both the whiskeys we had created were. Yeah, and, uh, the difference being it took me about a week to sober up after drinking 200 milliliters of it to prove to you how great it was. <laughs> mm. On the palate on this one as well, it's like you said, it's very, very hard beggy. But I see with hard beg, I get that kind of real big punch from the pea this is kind of a bit more it feels more well-rounded uh, and i mean i'm a big fan of our bag but I, I never would go as far as say it's well-rounded it's, it's usually quite um quite it's, i don't want to say smoky that's not smoky it's like burnt <laughs> woods you know like rather than kind of smoke it's you can actually taste the burning of the wood in it rather than a kind of freshly smoked fire um, and this is I, I almost think that's what's great about Ardbeg is it's like it's like being punched in the face with a whiskey like initially one of my kind of weird admissions is that I sort of five years ago maybe four or five years ago my brother-in-law Rob said to me I'm going for a whiskey tasting with some uh some relatives of ours will you come and I was like no I will not come why would I want to drink whiskey I don't I've just no interest in that and they um plied me with a variety of smoky whiskies and I think it was I probably I can't remember exactly but I'm pretty sure it was a actually a Talisker where you're kind of you're it's a flavor profile you don't get from anything else it's that kind of like smash in the face with a a chimney <laughs> if you can be smashed in the face with a chimney yeah I, remember, it, it, I, I don't know if it's because I've drunk six whiskies but I, I now want to quote uh, that, that song what would you look like with a chimney on you but oh, no. oh no insta ban <laughs> <laughs> the, the funny thing about that song was that i mean i remember it being released in like the the late 90s early 2000s or something as a, as a dance hit but it was actually a really old song as well right that really confused me that did when i heard it on like radio 2 or something once yeah i think it's a it's a, it's a sample of something else isn't it mm. on a kind of crappy 90s dance track so the yeah. this double barreled thing right i see this is the first time i've heard of this i, I don't uh, look into the, the douglas hang range very often but it's i'm trying to get in close there you go so do they do many more of these do you know i think they do a, a couple at least yeah they release them every now and then they're sort of like um douglas lang's core ranges are like provenance which is single cask um whiskies single malts generally i think i don't think they even do any grain in that range um at about 46 in fact they're all at 46 percent and those retail around 45 to 50 on average um and they tend to be quite young um i say quite young up to kind of 10 11 years then the old particular which is older barrels or some young islas and some of the more exclusive distilleries and then extra old particular which is super expensive but old particular is very good value and that's cast strength as is extra old particular so those are their core single cask whiskies um along with their other core range being the real, remarkable regional malts i.e the timorous beastie and the other ones in that range um so double barrel is one of their more select things um along with other stuff like you might have seen recently they just announced some have you, has anyone seen it was a lot of instagram posts and twitter about it they've released something that's in a sort of um ceramic flask almost i would describe it as um it was on their twitter feeds and instagram that's just, and stuff like that. that that's just a, a re-release of one of their older 
malts. I think it's harking back to some of the heritage of of Doug Lang Seniors kind of start because that's one of the, I guess, whiskey would not have been in a glass bottle. So ceramic bottles were kind of quite normal back in those days. That's good knowledge. I didn't know that. That's very interesting, actually. Um, yeah, I, I, every now and again, something comes up and I'm like, ah, do you know what? That's good. I like that. And that, I think you're probably right because glass only really came in kind of in the last few centuries, I guess. But um, but it, I think we're coming back to it as well, aren't we? I know we use glass bottles in whiskey all the time, but um, I think uh, in the advent of, of kind of people understanding in plastic a little bit more, things like milk will have to go back to glass, right? I think that's going to be a thing. Hey, I'm 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 uh, fully embracing my middle classness in that we've re recently re signed up to glass bottles in milk that arrives on our doorstep. It's cool. Oh, you still go with the milkman, right? Okay. Yeah. No, come back to the milkman, like come back to the milkman. School milk DJ. So just out of interest, coming back to double barrel, I have um just. Uh, by the Why way, would you take it back to the whiskey? We've covered yeah. oh, we've got <laughs> milk, yeah. milk in glass bottles, recycling. Very nonsense, milk. <laughs> go, on, go back to the whiskey then, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> That's all for you there, Vin. Um, so I've just had a little look. I've just, I've just popped this in the comments just for, for people's reference. Um, a link to search results for Double Barrel on the Douglas Lang website. So our begging for Gaelic is up there. Uh, they did one that they've called Isla and Highland, which obviously um, must be distillers that wish to keep that secret. But they've got a Bowmore and Inch Gower, Speyside and Lowland, and Ardbeg and Inch Gower. So they they seem to do it for contrast more than they go for kind of complementary in terms of the blends. Um, but the reason I love this is like people consider single cask whiskey at cast strength like the smws do like the douglas lang old particular like a lot of independent bottlers do and like special releases like committee releases and think people like Ard bag or lafroig like the pinnacle of like um single malt whiskey and whiskey in general and this is literally a blend that is taking a single cast from our bag which was specifically selected by someone who knows what they're doing at douglas lang and that's a single cask from Craigellachy and putting those two, two, two together. So this isn't this is two single cask whiskies combined, which is vastly more special to me than your typical single malt because a single malt, as we said earlier, would be a blend of many casks from that distillery designed to specifically replicate a flavour profile. So this is unique. Um, I was going to put say much more unique, which is. <laughs> not grammatically correct, but it's much more special and unusual than um, uh, your typical single malt. But it still has to be called a blend because that's whiskey for more than one distillery. But it, it is the closest thing you can have to a single cask whiskey that isn't a single cask whiskey. And yet, because it's a blend, it would be considered to be potentially second best in, yeah. in some people's heads. Just interesting enough, and it's it kind of slightly off topic, but some of the, your commenters are talking about Kill Karen, and um, Chris and I were were lucky enough to go around Kill Karen uh, two week, no three weeks ago now, and they were talking for those guys. It might be a might even be a uh, a, a no nonsense whiskey exclusive. The Kill Karen are actually going to be producing a, a highly peated malt coming out next year because it was something that spring bank had, had kind of looked at but couldn't find the space for in their calendar and so kill karen are looking at it and and are going to actually produce a highly peated malt which will be really interesting because i think um some of the guys are talking about uh our 10 being a real classic whiskey at that price and, and a really good value whiskey but i think i'd also say kill karen is a, an another brilliantly priced whiskey less than 40 quid really flavorsome loads going on and, and a real like different flavor for those people who are not super peaty like an hard bag but want something smoky and interesting kill karen definitely has a lot to offer those people and and a, a super like heavy peated kill karen we really interesting to try so kind of keep an eye out you heard it first here no nonsense whiskey stream definitely. <laughs> two hours Two hours in, that's when we produce the good stuff, right? <laughs> I don't want to talk about the Kill Karen too much because it's actually, um, uh, my review tomorrow, Thursday's uh, video is Kill Karen 12. 
So uh, if you want to check out my thoughts on Kill Karen, then come back tomorrow uh, about 6 p.m. UK, and that's when I'll be uh, I'll be releasing that video. So I, I'm a big fan. And like you said, I, I mirror what you said there. Excellent value. Uh, and I, I was, it was one of those whiskeys where I, I was loath to do a video, actually, because the more people that hear about it, the less likely it's going to be to be cheap, right? Because it's it's only limited stocks and they're going to sell out of it if too many people know about it. So it's one of those ones where I was like, oh, maybe I should keep this a secret. Maybe I shouldn't tell anybody about it. I think one of those great things, and we we only genuinely found this out by touring Springbank, is I don't think Springbank will ever be expensive because they, those guys are just absolutely all about the whiskey. They're all about producing. It's like if you get a chance to tour Springbank, it is like going around a museum that still somehow manages to produce whiskey. And so I think with the Kill Karen stuff, they're just basically producing great quality single malt and, and that's the price they'll sell it at because that's what they think it's worth. And I think it's there's something within a, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing your review of him because within an industry that's kind of absolutely blowing up the price and taking all the money, Kill Karen stands alone with with Springbank and a few others where they actually just price whiskey where they think it's worth and then, and then move on. Absolutely. So uh, we are actually coming up to the two hour mark. So I think it's probably a good time to talk about what we think is uh, our favorites of the day. Um, I mean, for me, usually I don't like to talk about the sixth round because it's it, it's clearly the, the highest valued on the board. But um, if you discount that, then I think my favorite is probably actually the six year boutique whiskey, which is just phenomenal. I really love that whiskey. I don't know what you guys are thinking of your favorites. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm going to go Doug Lang. I, I really like the Timorous Beastie. I think the. I, I think the regional malts series is a great collection of malts to try something different and also to introduce your uh, viewers to vatted malt, where you get a great quality blended whiskey. I think at a great price as well. And we were again lucky enough to try the Goldrens, which I'd not tried before. The Campbelltown malt, and and that, I was really impressed by that. It stood itself. Uh, stood it stood out in a pretty ridiculous lineup of whiskey that we got to try. So I'm going to go Timorous Beastie and say if you can't quite stretch budget wise to the 18, just just bang 40 quid at the standard Timorous Beastie. How about you, Chris? I would say so. Uh, first of all, I have I, I do love that phenomenology, but mainly because I think it's just chock full of Glenlossie, and I really enjoyed the Glenlossie that I had recently. Just the fruitiness is just off the scale. The depth of it as well with fruitiness, um, um, but I I probably put that second to what Rob said. I, I agree. The Timorous Beastie for me, like the extra sherry cask influence that I think is in there, like that that really blew me away. That dram. I've, I, but honorary mention to this. Um, I'm still working on it, the Ardbeg Krigelaki, because I, I would struggle a bit with an Ardbeg. It's just being too heavy for me in terms of the peat presence. But the Krigelaki, I'm not saying I'm, I can't really taste a lot of Krigelaki, but it's almost like it softened the Ardbeg without being that present itself, um, which I'm quite enjoying. Definitely. I mean, I shouldn't discount the other ones because um, both ones you said, the, the Timber Beastie and the uh, Douglas Lang Double Barrel, both incredible. And even earlier on, when we covered the uh, the two the two cheapo ones, and that's the uh, Douglas and King of Scots and the uh, Nika blended, but both very good whiskies in their price brackets, but um, absolutely outclassed by what what was in the rest of the tasting by a long shot. If you if you were comparing them in the same bracket, then then yeah, the uh, I mean, again for me the Batiki whiskey one win, wins, but only by a, a, a hair a margin. Had I'd really be interested to see what some of your reviewers, like some of your viewers, make of uh, of Nika Blended, though. And and I'd really uh, well look forward to seeing a Trini and C video about their their latest favourite Nika video, uh, Nika whiskey, because I think Nika Black again, it's another great whiskey that has lots to offer. Yeah, I did the Nika White a long time ago, and I've done uh, another. It was I think it was just called Nika Malt, uh, and a couple of others. I've done like the uh, Takatsura and stuff like that. But um, generally speaking, they're just they're just good whiskies. You know, they're they're mostly blended, and um, 
they they just do it with quality and that, i think the, th the key thing about them is they're really trying hard to emulate uh flavors from scotch so uh it's it's not an alienating flavor it, it's very familiar to people who like scotch and it and it's cheap in this country anyway at least yeah uh, that's that, that is definitely true then that they they are the most non-scotch scotches <laughs> that you get out there without a doubt without a doubt okay well uh that's two hours then guys so um i think it's probably a good time to wrap it up um if you if you guys want to just talk a little bit about what you do again so that people who are still watching can see um how about you chris you just let us know about your the drum team i'm gonna pass immediately over to rob because i'm just trying to answer Roy's <laughs> question right now <laughs> so uh, rob <laughs> <prefer> to rob <laughs> for at least one minute I'll say if you um, if you get a little bit bored of watching YouTube and want to read some uh, real reviews without my ugly face in, you can check out therealdram.com. We try to produce reviews and we've got some stuff coming up about a trip to Campbelltown. If you're thinking of a trip to Scotland and fancying a trip around distillery, we visited Lot Lomond, we visited Kilcarran, we visited uh, Springbank and they're all going to come up in the next few weeks. And if you're Bristol based or around there, check out bristolwhiskey.com. Uh, we run a whiskey tasting monthly. And the idea is that we do almost like the dram team, but in real life uh, rather than through the post. So if you, if you can't subscribe to the dram team, come along to bristolwhiskey.com, drink six whiskeys with us, and uh, we will do our best to treat you to something great. But if you uh, like, most of your viewers <laughs> you are far from paces i pass back to chris who will provide you with a postal version well like i said earlier i can only apologize if people are not in the uk i would love to send you some whiskey but i can't do it at a price that would be affordable or reasonable um yeah so following up from what rob said like you know if you can get over to bristol look us up whether we've got an event going at the time or not we've got um whiskey shelves and we're always happy to host people uh dom see you tomorrow i can see dom Byer there in the comments say he must be joining us tomorrow at the volley here in bristol the pub that we hold our tastings in it's going to be a sherry fiesta i'm quite excited about it i can't say anymore because i don't want to ruin the surprise um dom just don't look at the website and see what's in our christmas box because five out of the six are in that tasting tomorrow uh same for you rob um yeah the dram team we just the dram team.co.uk and we're the dram team on twitter the dram team on facebook and the dram team with underscores between each word on an instagram although i never get around to posting on social that much except just before i'm doing these events with vin these days so uh, what i am going to be doing if anyone's interested so you know we talked about calendars earlier i think i'm pointing to it right now um what i'm going to do is i'm going to fill that up with some drams from our back catalog and just try and actually challenge myself to be a bit more dedicated like Vin on social media uh, and post a little bit about some of the drams I've had in the past. Um, so yeah, join in with that conversation. Let me know what you think about some of the drams. Let me know more of your thoughts and calendars. I'm gonna have a look up through the, the comments and see what people have said. I'm dead keen to try and find a way to make calendars more affordable for whiskey drinkers in general and to, to make the quality of whiskey in there better um it's difficult and it's um but i'm talking to independent bottlers i'm talking to other people about how i might be able to get hold of liquid at a better value than i'm able to get it from trade suppliers so yeah feedback from people on what they want really important because we can go any way with this we can go 10 mil do you want to drink one every day and take a, a little festival size sampler or something really special we can do that if you want to put a 50 mil glass bottle in there and see it more as something that you'd buy and drink over the course of the year rather than actually drinking it during Advent, we can do that too. But like, um, I just want to know what people are interested in, what sort of whiskeys, what size bottle. Those are the two main questions and maybe the format of calendar. The advantage of this one being buy it once and we'll send you whiskeys the next year. Um, but yeah, tell me what you think. So that, that's the, that's my, if we had one main request, that would be like, when I start doing that social stuff about calendars, chip in with your opinions, because the exact people listening to this podcast, this podcast, a live stream, are the sort of people that I'm interested to hear from about what you want, because uh, the jam team basically exists to introduce people to, to whiskies and to get people whiskey at good value that they might not otherwise try. So let me know what you reckon. Awesome. Well, thanks very much, guys, for joining me for uh, another live stream. Um, don't forget to check out my review tomorrow, which is the Kilcarran 12 year. 
Uh, hopefully, I'm going to have um, one more live stream this year uh, with a very special guest who I haven't locked down yet, so I won't announce. But um, yeah, thanks everyone for checking out the stream again. Uh, hopefully, you've enjoyed these six drams. I've got a little bit left of each of them, so I might just uh, finish my evening off with those. But uh, yeah, thanks to you guys for, for joining me, and thanks to everyone in the chat for uh, keeping this going. And again, apologies for my dropout, but I think you uh, everyone enjoyed it anyway, so that's all good. I just enjoyed taking the mick out of you while you were here, to be honest. <laughs> I don't yeah. blame you at all. I'm actually looking forward to seeing the replay and find out what happened there. As standing hosts, I think we did actually probably, we talked about whiskey for longer in that small section than we did for the rest of the time. So awesome. <laughs> thanks for having us in and putting up with our nonsense and uh, we'll see you again soon. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, ben, and thanks, everyone. thanks everyone in the chat for um, your interest and for getting involved. Absolutely. Getting involved, yeah. Made it what it was. Awesome. Well, again, thanks, everybody. Uh, it's been an excellent stream, and I'll see you all on, on a, more videos in the future. Slash. Yeah. Bye, everyone.